Across America and around the world, you're listening once again to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Is there a group of men and women out there who are secretly controlling our finances, our media, communications, and every aspect of our lives? Well, my two guests think that there very well might be. Uh, we have Jordan Maxwell, who has made an appearance in Ancient Mysteries of the Bible on CBS with William Devane hosting it, and he has agreed to come back and do the sequel. And we have Anthony J. Hilder, of Radio Free World. Both of these people will be appearing at Wembley Arena in England on uh, Saturday the 9th and the 10th of January 93. And under uh, Jordan Maxwell's name, there's a quote that I'd like to bring to your attention, and I'd like to start off with uh, Jordan answering this. It is probable that most of the public figures and military men involved and the secret scheme are unaware of the real goals or who is really behind it. Jordan, I've, I've got to ask, what's, what's going on here? <laughs> well, let's, let's start with a, uh, a term that we're hearing quite a bit about in the last couple of years, the New World Order. Uh, our president is uh, going all around the world proclaiming a New World Order. Incidentally, all the presidents, uh, living presidents, along with many of the heads of state throughout the world are going to meet, according to the LA Times, are going to meet in the year 2000 at the pyramid in Egypt to bring in what is called the New World Order. Uh, there is something going on here on an international worldwide scale right b before our eyes, but that so many of us are unaware and consequently we're not really seeing what is happening. Uh, there is in fact a conspiracy or a planned world domination coming by this thing that George Bush calls a new world order. On the back of the one dollar bill, there are a lot of important occult symbolism on the back of the one dollar bill. Uh, on the left hand side, you'll see the pyramid and the pyramid of Egypt. That's an Egyptian pyramid on, a, on an American dollar bill. Um, the significance <clears throat> is very important. Above the pyramid, you will see the words annuit coeptus, which basically means in Latin, our enterprise is a success, or our project has been crowned with success. And the, the project, which is a success, is on the banner beneath the pyramid, uh, novas ordo seclorum, uh, being Latin for new order of the world, or the new world order. On the bottom of the pyramid, you will see the Roman numerals for 1776. This exact identical emblem of the pyramid within the circle, the Novus Ordo Seclorum, uh, has not, it was not original in America. It was first found on writings that are today in museums in Europe in the year 1774, 1775, by a man named Adam Weishaupt who founded the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati, a secret society of Freemasons operating in Europe that had designs on the entire world and to bring about what they call a new world order. So that emblem on the back of the dollar bill on the left-hand side with the, with the pyramid is not an American symbol. It is a very old symbol Jordan, coming you from you a... You should bring out the fact that this is the Order of the Illuminati. Yes. And the May 1st, 1776, did not signic uh, signify the creation of the United States of America, no, no, but the all. order of the Illuminati for the enlightened ones or the Luciferians. Yes. And this is a satanic symbol. It is on the cover of the Illuminati documents from May 1st, 1776, which obviously precedes the birth of this nation on July 4th, 1776. Okay. And at the very top of the pyramid, there's a, the Agpu all seeing eye, which was the name of the Soviet secret police during the Stalin era. All right, now, Anthony, you've done, you spent most of your life studying these secret societies and the Illuminati, and you uh, put out a record some time ago mm -hmm. called the Illuminati 
CFR. The CFR, CFR. Council CFR. on Foreign Relations, right. 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 Um, this is, you know, I've heard various charlatans coming out talking about the Illuminati, but I was wondering if you could get into a little bit more detail about the history of this organization and some of the more, uh, you were talking about uh, the eagle, for instance, and mm -hmm. the pyramids and that yes. sort of thing, right. and talk a little bit about the Freemasonry origins of the Illuminati. Well, let me just make this one comment first, and okay. then Anthony can uh, go on with it. The, at the top of the pyramid, you'll see the little triangle with the eye in it. The eye was the eye of Horus. Uh, Horus was the eye of God, the sun. And so the sun represented the pupil or the eye of God in the ancient Egyptian philosophy. And that's why you'll see the light emanating from around the eye. So it's the worship of light, Luciferianism. It's the worship of the coming forth of light into the world. And therefore our masters, uh, these, these manipulating masters behind the scenes of world government who are manipulating all peoples, uh, consider themselves to be enlightened, enlightened despots, enlightened people. And of course, when you uh, go to university, you graduate from a university, you wear the Masonic square of Freemasonry on your, on your head to symbolize that you're an alumni. Alumni comes from the word illumini. You have been illuminated into the enlightened power structure of the new world order. That's the actual basis for these symbols and to go on with the rest of the symbolism. Well, <clears throat> I think it's important to bring out the fact that George Bush did not write the New World Order. In fact, if you want to know who wrote the New World Order, you simply go back to Adolf Hitler. It wasn't his first book, that was Mein Kampf. The second book, right. The New World Order. Right. And R Rudolf Hess went out and said, uh, in introduction of Hitler, he said, uh, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. One world, one race, one ruler. That's what this whole United Nations is all about. And I'm for a free world. That's in total opposition to the New World Order. Well, Bush's New World Order may have come from Adolf Hitler, but Bill Clinton's New Covenant clearly comes from the Old Testament. All right, now, the New Covenant, that is a, that is a catchphrase. That is a term which has been used for uh, at least 500 years by a secret society of Freemasons in Europe called the British Israel World Federation. British Israel World Federation, you can see uh, topics in movies based on this subject like uh, there's a motion picture just come out called uh, uh, The Handmaiden's Tale, based on British Israel philosophy for America. A secret society of Freemasons promoting something that is called, as far back as 500 years ago, British Israel philosophy, Anglo-Israel philosophy, which is tying in the Old Testament governmental system to be the basis for a new world order in the coming future. And that's why uh, the well, symbolism... Clinton went to Oxford. Didn't yeah, he? And, and it has to Rhodes do with Rhodes Scholar. Scholar. Right. right. The Rhodes Scholarship Foundation, <laughs> and this whole thing of a new covenant comes uh, directly from British Israel Freemasonry. Rhodes Scholar, the Rhodes Scholarship of England. So uh, that we can get into that. It gets, we can get into all of the occult well, British, significance of, of of uh, the Democratic Party, uh, his term and uh, his term of the uh, the covenant, the new covenant, and Cecil Rhodes is the founder of Rhodesia. That's yeah. where Rhodesia got its name, and we had a little thing called the Round Table and uh, some of these uh, Luciferian groups. And I say Luciferian, I mean it. Like George Bush Typical. is a member of the Skull and Bones. Yeah. Now, in the Skull and Bones. Uh, Fraternity. This is the Faustian Financial Fraternity that started up at Yale University in 1832. Came over here as, uh, as a bounce off of the Jacobin Society, which was involved in the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. At Yale University, they have a structure, and you can go there. Anybody can go there and uh, see this structure they call a tomb. Inside the tomb, they have uh, their initiation and uh, the fellows, they lay down in a coffin, and George Bush was one of them. They lay down in a coffin nude, and they're born again into this satanic order. It's the ritual. It's been there. William Buckley Jr., the Harrimans, yeah, conservatives, oh. no. George Bush isn't a conservative. Never had Ronald that. Reagan is not a conservative. In fact, uh, Ronald Reagan is so far left, 
I mean, can I say this? Ronald Reagan is not a conservative. He never was a conservative. He is not a conservative. He never will be a conservative. In the early days, they used to call him Red Ronnie. It's as simple as that. He was a, in the United World Federalist for 13 years. He was in the L.A. Committee for a Democratic Far Eastern Policy, which was associated with the Institute of Pacific Relations, which was listed as an instrument of the Soviet Union. This guy is so far left, he makes Fidel Castro look like a member of the John Burt Society. All you've ever heard about Ronald Reagan was simply rhetoric. We have a one-party system okay. controlled by this oligarchy. All right, that's George Bush. That's uh, the Skull and Bone Society. And I, okay, I, I, I guess I can see this. But Bill Clinton, though, um, he was not a member of the Skull and Bone Society. No, I believe. Is, is Bill Clinton a member of the Council on Foreign Relations? Oh, yes, he certainly is. He's CFR. Yeah, is George Bush yeah, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Bill Clinton wasn't laying naked in a coffin trying to get born again. No, 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 no. no, no, but, no, no, no. but we have, let me go back to an election, 1980. We had uh, Jimmy Carter from the Trilateral Commission. That's right. We had George Bush from the Trilateral Commission. And John Anderson from the Trilateral Commission is the independent ticket. So it wouldn't make any difference which way the coin flipped. Uh, heads they win, tails we lose. The Rockefellers Our tails have never we lost win, an election heads in the last they, 60 years. Well, no, we lose even if the coin landed on its side. They had all bases covered. Aren't you, you know, when you, you mentioned the Trilateral Commission and you mentioned the uh, Rockefellers, mm -hmm. Um, I've heard many fringe groups, from, ranging from the fundamentalists to the neo-Nazis or whatever, taking bits and pieces of this and constructing it to their own agenda. Aren't you worried about being misinterpreted? They all people? have their own Everybody spin. Everybody has their own spin on it, right? their own agenda. But what we're talking about is things that can be proven from accepted uh, reference works and, and how you use that information to promote your own philosophies, your own agenda, is, is, you know, that's their problem. And there is, you're saying that there is proof that from May the 1st, 1776, that the organization, the Illuminati, began. Oh, you can look that up. And to, the, and to this, end of this very day, the Illuminati is still yes, around. Absolutely. All right. you need the to cover do of their document is the left-hand side, a reverse of the, seal of the, of the, of dollar, the dollar bill. bill. And it was, in, it was put on there early on, but uh, it was the reverse seal early on. But it wasn't until the corn cob mystic, vice president, George, Wa not George Wallace, but Henry Wallace, Henry C. Wallace. Uh, who talked to Roosevelt and said, hey, this thing has got to go on there. Now, he had in the White House a little shrine for Madame Blavatsky. Now, yeah. Blavatsky wrote... Uh, Isis Unveiled and the well, Secret well, Doctrine. She, yeah, but she had, a, she had a manifesto going. She, she also had a publication of a, a book. Uh, well, I've seen the books. It's the combined works of Lucifer. Yeah. She had Lucifer magazine, and I've held those copies of Lucifer in my hand, leather bound. Uh, she was the uh, publisher and co-editor with Annie Vassant, and from this Lucifer organization came Theosophy, and there's only, and from Theosophy came uh, uh, Unity, came uh, what is, uh, <coughs> yes, the this, other, this the other. one world religion philosophy, and if you go to the United Nations, they've got a meditation room, and you'll find out that the Baha'i religion is the only one that is accepted in the United Nations. In the mediation room, you're going to find the little uh, Illuminati pyramid. So they, they're, it's loaded with symbology, and Jordan Maxwell is the expert on it. And what I was going to say, too, is that the United Nations uses a particular publishing firm for all of their documents and public and books and materials and it's called Lucius Publishing. The United Nations use Lucius Publishing. Lucius Publishing was at one time Helena Blavatsky's Lu Lucifer Publishing. So uh, today the whole funded concept, by the Lucifer Trust. The Lucifer Trust, United Nations. That's why it's in New York because New York is referred to as the Empire State because it's the new state of the new empire that is coming. That's why Steven Spielberg and George Lucas with their Indiana Jones and the Empire Strikes Back. It has to do with occultism. It has to do with uh, numerology. It has to do with a lot of mysticism coming out of theosophy. Uh, the, the point being is that we are involved in some very powerful occult um, manipulation of the world by some very astute 
occultists, and we are not even uh, beginning to be aware of it, how it, far it's, down it's we are. It's crazy to have a united <clears throat> world government. I don't want to do away with our individuality. Some people are white, some people are black. Tall, short, fat, thin. Muslims, Buddhists, Christians, Jews. I like the diversity. I don't want to see a world with 220 nations. I want to see a world with maybe 3,000 nations. I believe in the right to integrate, to segregate, to separate, to have linguistic, tribal nation states emerge where there are these people, like in Africa, and I lived there for a while, where the Metabeles have been fighting the Mishonas. Let them have their own nation states. Let that division take place. Let there be a free world alliance. Let there be a Croatia. Let there be a Serbia. Let all individuals separate and find a place that is comfortable. Let them do their own thing in their own time and their own way. If somebody wants to be a racist, let them be a racist. Let them have a racist state. Let Israel exist. It is, it's a religious state. Mm -hmm. It has a racist philosophy, fine. But let there be a Palestine. Let there be an independent Gaza. I would like to see the secession of Alaska. I worked there on Radio Free America for three and a half years. I called for the independence of Alaska. It should be an independent nation. Well, you know, when you, you're mentioning all this conspiracy stuff, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, when various things happened, like when the riots happened, Mm -hmm. um, uh, about six months ago. April 29th and May 1st. Right, and the, but, 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 but when it happened and when just about everything bad in our society that's happened, not just the riots, I mean, it's almost tempting to want to believe that there are people behind there pulling the strings and all that because <coughs> it, it creates the false sense of security that if we can just stop these people, we can have a better life and that sort of thing. But we can have a better life if we stop you, these people. You don't people. think it's just There's a bunch of incompetent arcade. people just uh, making mistakes and that oh, maybe heaven, you're no. just reading no, things no, no, and no. things? How, how could everything happen just accidentally? I mean, uh, just, uh, <laughs> everything goes wrong and it just happens to go wrong every time, everywhere. and. We've been getting worse off and worse off and worse off. Ronald Reagan and George Bush, who are supposed to be conservatives, quote, conservatives, tripled the national debt. I mean, all of the, the, the debt that was acquired from George Washington through Jimmy Carter, they tripled the national debt. And then reporters get out there and say, hey, I'm uh, thinking that these guys are conservative. They're not conservative. But can't you just God. write it up to a bad economic plan instead of saying that there let are people me, let behind me explain this by design. Let me explain You'll something explain to you. Bad economic you do plan. not get to be president of the United States, and you do not have hundreds of advisors, highly educated, proficient advisors in every field of activity of human endeavor, getting C2 reports every day from the CIA. You're getting USIA, DIA documentation every hour on the hour for the economy of the world all things happening in the earth being, being, uh, being directed to the president's table. You don't make mistakes when you have become president. You have the finest minds in the world working for you, the finest intellects that the Western world can produce. That's why, you, that's why in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, our country is the most powerful economic society on earth because we are a very powerfully intellectual society. We don't make mistakes. Well, Roosevelt put it this way. In politics, in politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, it, it was, was planned be. that way. Right. So they planned on George Bush and Dan Quayle. Oh, yeah. No oh, doubt about yeah. George Bush and Dan Quayle are some fact, of our most intelligent people working. No, for hell, no, they're not no. our most intelligent people, <laughs> no, but they're, no, no, no. They they're, they're, are they are fronts. conspiratorial. They're I mean, when you get somebody from the Skull and Bones and the Trilateral yeah. Commission and a guy who says, uh, everything I am today I owe to David Rockefeller, founder of the Trilateral Commission. Why is it that we don't uh, talk about this organization? If they were members of the Nazi Party, if they were members of the Boy Scouts, or... Uh, some drag queen over in West Hollywood, we would be talking about them. They would be front page That's headlines. Right. But the Trilateral Commission, 78, 90 p people, who controls all three candidates for the President of the United States in 1980? We, we, have a, we, have a, we, we like to say in this country that we have the ability as Americans to elect 
But the problem is we do not have the ability to select. We can only elect, which means that we can only vote for those candidates which are put before us by our masters, our hidden masters behind the scenes. And when you understand that the Democratic and the Republican Party are financed, and believe me, in this world, money is the bottom line, if you have it or if you don't. And the, the Democratic and the, the, and the uh, Republican Party are financed and organized and directed by the same banking families, the same people who finance your banks or the same people who finance your institutions of government. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, word, the word for bench in relation to a judge sitting on the bench comes from banco, which is in Latin, meaning the bank. The judge sits on the bench, which is a Latin word for the bank. He officiates for the system. So when you go into a court, you're sitting before a, a court of order, which is actually being financed by government. How so many what we're talking yeah, about here is a system. How many people know that the Federal Reserve is not federal? It has nothing to do with the It government. is not a reserve. No. They create that fiat funny money that you use. It's like monopoly money. For less than a penny a note, they lend it to the U.S. Treasury in exchange for interest-bearing bonds. They print this stuff for less than a penny a note. They lend it in exchange for interest-bearing bonds. They issue this into circulation as debt-bearing currency. We cannot exist as a free and independent nation when this evilarchy controls the strings. We have to abolish the privately owned Federal Reserve System. And that's why on the dollar bill it says up in the uh, left-hand corner uh, on the dollar bill, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. The reason it was put on there is because it was a piece of paper, and you have to tell the people that it's legal. You don't have to it tell anyone. It used to say, and it's redeemable in lawful money. Yes. In but lawful, in redeemable in lawful, in lawful money. money. That meant it wasn't, it's not lawful money. It's right. not a dollar. If you have a piece of toilet paper, it can be used and tossed away. But as soon as you print Federal Reserve note, it becomes an obligation of the public to pay. So what we're saying is that the Federal Reserve System has nothing whatsoever to do with the federal government. Just like federal vacuum cleaners and federated department stores has nothing to do with, it's a word. It is a play on words. A Federal Reserve System is a private banking institution with most of its holders. Uh, the Class A stockholders have never been revealed never. to the United States public. Okay, There's this, never been an you. audit. Right. Never been an audit. Independent audit. This organization, okay, that you say is pulling strings here. Mm -hmm. um, who, how many people are controlling this? Is this at the helm of one man? or is no, this, uh, It's an no. oligarchy. It's an I oligarchy. call it an evilarchy because they want to bring about a Luciferian new world order. And by Luciferian... Uh, We're talking exactly, about. You, 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 do you mean? I'm talking about a satanic, a satanic order. And if you take a look at the layout of Washington D.C. and Jordan Maxwell is the expert on this. No, I've, I've got. You right. will find out that the entire city was laid out in uh, in symbols. Uh, if you take a look at the obelisk and the Illuminati pyramid at the top of the. Uh, uh, Yes, as a matter of fact, the, the two, the, the the two main monument. streets going toward the, the Capitol building, if you take, uh, which I have pictures okay. over, the, over the city, looking down on Washington, D.C., you'll see there are two main boulevards uh, culminating in a pyramid. And just at the very top of the pyramid is a street cutting it off. And then within the, the triangle at the top, where the eye on the dollar bill is, is the Capitol. And the Capitol building sits there. It's a pyramid. Then it has the, uh, uh, the Cleopatra's Needle, which is a Washington monument. And the, and the river, the long riverway, uh, the long waterway is called the River Styx, which is where Pharaoh went into heaven on the River Styx. It is all laid out in Masonic symbolism. And the, and the five-pointed star, which is a pentagram, has always been used. Satan worship, Satanic worship, the five-pointed pentagram. And if you take the arms off of a pentagram, you have a pentagon. And the United States Pentagon is sitting exactly due north, aiming due north at the North Star Thuban, 
which is drawing power, according to the ancient Egyptians, for, for the god of war. It's the same all pentagram of this that was on the, the Night Stalker's hand. Right. Now, I'm I trying to get a angle. All satanic ritual I'm, killings. I'm trying to get an angle, though, on what mm -hmm. exactly you mean by Satanism. Are you referring, or satanic, do you mean the elevation of human reason, or do you, the, the strong survive, or do you mean a group of people who are actually worshiping a bona fide spiritual... Uh, we're talking That's about the warlocks of Washington here. We're talking about people who have satanic rituals. We're talking about people who believe in a Lucifer 2000. We've ta we're talking about uh, the creation of a new world order in a millennium. And Only George Bush talks survive. about a thousand points of light. What do you think he's talking about, a thousand points of light? Could it be a thousand year millennium under Lucifer? What do you think, Jordan? Yes, oh, I, there's no doubt in my mind that all the terminology are, is the same. If you go back through the speeches that Adolf Hitler made and, and the top Nazi speechwriters, and then, then listen to what Ronald Reagan had to say and, and George Bush, and now our new uh, in, incoming president. Well, Hitler the talked about a thousand points yeah. of, uh, he's talked about a thousand year Reich, and Bush is talking about a thousand points of light. And I don't think it's just a coincidence and not that Adolf of light. Hitler's second book is... Not points of light. And his, his term, Bush is New talking World about Order, a thousand Bush's points of Order. light. thousand points of light. Light is very important to Luciferians. It has to do with Lucifer. It has to do with satanic societies. And what we're, what we're saying here is that the government of the United States is in the hands of some very powerful, sinister people who are manipulating not only us, but the rest of the world. If you can take a look at, ma uh, just take a, a, a road map of Washington, D.C. Just take a look at it from the air. And you'll see what appears to be the goat of Mendez. Which, and the goat of Mendez. Which and, is a symbol in Freemasonry. Right. It's a symbol, it's a, it's a demonic symbol within the Freemasonry. You see the goat order. and the, the horns and the whole thing. The, the whole city is laid out like that. It's all over. So what we're basically saying here is that there is nothing happening by chance. As, as I brought out before, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg with their Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And the Last Crusade is for the uh, Holy Grail, the Cup of Christ. It's not by chance that we have movies like that because they're in, why is Adolf Hitler always involved with Indiana Jones? Uh, the Last Crusade you can't understand unless you understand the First Crusade. The First Crusade was, uh, was developed by what we call the Knights Templars Masonic Lodge. The Knights Templars are the ones that gave us what we call the Columbian faction of the Illuminati, which comes to America and founds itself in the state of New York, which comes from the old York Rite in England, from the Duke of York to old York, England, to New York, the Empire State. Then, if you understand that uh, Europe was dominating, Europe has dominated um, the world for almost 1,600 years, and we refer to Europe as the old world. Therefore, the power structure of Europe is the old world order. That's the power structure of the old world. We're going to be doing some more of this.
Well, George Bush is gone, but is the New World Order gone? That's kind of what we were talking about on our last show with our guest, Anthony J. Hilder from Radio Free World, and Jordan Maxwell, a social historian. And um, Jordan, the last time we were talking, we talked about the Illuminati and various conspiracies and all. You wanted to talk about the difference between the Old World Order and the New World Order. Right. We're hearing this term, New World Order, and, uh, and, our, and our troops are in the Middle East because of something called a New World Order. Uh, I just wanted to bring uh, to your attention the reason for that term. Europe is referred to as the Old World, and the power structure of the Old World was referred to as the Old World Order. I mean, the old Romanov dynasties, the Rothschilds of England, the banking dynasties throughout Europe, and the, and the, uh, the whole power structure of what we call Europe was the European Old World Order. And it dominated the world for almost 1,600 years. Uh, Europe has dominated the world. But with the coming of America, or Cristo Colombia, uh, the founding of America, we now are in what we call the New World. Consequently, there is a New World power structure in Western civilization and uh, centered in America. And so that's what uh, George Bush is talking about. A New World Order is a New World fraternal order. Because the word in the dictionary means a fraternal or a knightly order, uh, like the Masonic order, a lodge. And so what we're talking about, New World Order, is, a, is a, a power structure centered in the New World. And we're seeing uh, terminologies in movies and motion pictures, like we said, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas with The Empire Strikes Back. It has to do with New York being the empire state, the state of the new empire, connecting uh, New York with the old York dynasty in England. And, uh, and America strikes back at the old order, which is the First and Second World War, and if you understand the connections between the Vatican and the European banking families, and Europe being the old world order, as opposed to America being a, um, a new world order, and the empire strikes back, and of course the head of the, the all Freemasons will, will recognize that Yota is little Yuta or Yota is the is the uh, ideologue of the Knights Templars Freemasonic Order, uh, giving us what we call the York Rite or New York, and so all of these things are mystical symbols and emblems, and from that we have we can open up a can of worms well, on you get all down, kinds. The, the bottom line, the bottom line of this whole thing is one world government. Right. Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. They want one world, one currency, one race, one religion. And if you ever read uh, anything from Global 2000, you'll find out that they plan to reduce the population of this planet by 25% by the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And how are they going to do that? Designer diseases. Mm -hmm. It's my thesis, it's Dr. Robert Strecker's thesis, that they have created AIDS and disseminated AIDS through the hepatitis B vaccine shots to the homosexual community in the United States, to the Public Health Service, and to the blacks in Senegal, Uganda, Zaire, the Central African Republic, Haiti, and Brazil, for the purpose of reducing the population of the planet by this 25%, by the year 2000, yeah. through the smallpox vaccine shots over there. Yeah, what I have a, a, a difficult time uh, trying to get by here, and mm -hmm. maybe a lot of people do too, is we're uniting a lot of things. I mean, the Empire State Building with the Empire, Yoda with the Knights Templar, and now we're talking about AIDS with the government. I'm just wondering, and Christopher Columbus, I'm wondering, isn't there any part of human history where things are just the result of incompetence, <clears throat> where right. it just happens? Well, there is a conspiracy of, uh, of, this, of conspiracy. this oligarchy to bring about this global government upon the ashes of the United States of America. And all of you would be enslaved or slaughtered if you don't go along with their gig. The new plan. The plan, yeah. the new world order. Novus Ordo Seclorum. It's on the dollar bill. Adolf Hitler wrote it. George Bush is implementing it. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, You're appearing at uh, Wembley uh, Arena in England here. And this is, this is uh, one of your posters here. A global deception. And, of course, it has. The AIDS is a man-made disease. That's... 
that's probably a big draw. A lot of people are concerned about AIDS. And it is a man's man-made disease. And it should it be was concerned. created at Fort Detrick. There's no question in my mind about that. The World Health Organization went out to give these smallpox vaccine shots to the innocent blacks. And AIDS is vector-borne. AIDS is a cancer. They don't want to come up with a cure until the population of Africa has been diminished substantially. I think that black people in Africa are an endangered species. In South Central uh, Los Angeles, not far from where we are right now, at one high school with kids giving blood to the blood bank, mm -hmm. it was discovered that there was 90% that were HIV positive. These are teenage black kids. I'm saying that AIDS is not simply epidemic or pandemic, it's mega pandemic, and AIDS is murder. This is a, this is, it's a designer disease, and it is a program to mass murder people on the planet, talking to reduce about, the population. Talking about South Central, um, the Illuminati uh, began if I'm to understand you right, on May the 1st, 1776, mm -hmm. and you were uh, ascribing some sort of significance to the fact that, that the riot we had recently happened right. on, uh, on May 1st. April the 29th to May the 1st. That's right. May 1st was, uh, was the founding date of the Bavarian Illuminati in Germany in the year 1776. This you can find in any uh, encyclopedia in any library. Look up the word Illuminati. Illuminati comes from illumine or illuminate, meaning the worship of light, the enlightened ones, those who are the masters who manipulate the world finance and manipulate world government. Illuminati was founded May 1st, 1776, and that's why in Soviet Union and all communist countries you have a great celebration on May Day. May Day was a symbol for, or May Day was the celebration of the founding of the World Revolution Conspiracy in um, in Germany, and then later on goes into France, into uh, the and I French hope they don't have to burn the city before the people see the real yeah. light of yeah. what's and, going and on. And so that's why our, our riot that happened here in Los Angeles happened on May 1st. It was all prearranged, pre-set up by this government, had nothing to do with the people in the area. I've talked to many of the oh, black wait, wait, people wait. in the area. You, you say this government. You mean yeah. you're talking mm -hmm. about by those who control this government? Yeah, I'm talking about those who control this government, not 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 the government itself, but those who are behind the scenes who control this government and decide what it will and will not do. And to control the black <clears throat> projects, the yeah. central the intelligence agency. Are you able to zero in on exactly who these people are who are the government? The government, the invisible the government. government. Now, I mean, people invisible. talk about the invisible <clears throat> government. Yeah, I talk about it as an evil archy. Well, as, are you able to to t zero in on as who a group, these people are well, in the evil archy? Members of the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm not saying all members of the Council on Foreign Relations are illuminist. Members of the Trilateral Commission. Members of the Club of Rome. The Bohemian Skull and Bones Society. Fraternity. Yes. The, the Bohemian Society. Here's a, a group <clears throat> of presidents up there with black robes, like Klansmen sitting around this huge bonfire at the Bohemian <coughs> Grove, uh, we have worshiping color, we this have color giant pictures of owl. This. Yeah, we have, we have color pictures of the, of the presidents of the United States, all living presidents today, uh, and dressed in large uh, black robes with pointed headdresses like the Ku Klux Klan in front of a large open fire pit, a pit of fire, uh, and, the, and the article appeared said that it was after 12 midnight, all the American presidents line up on this altar and worship the owl. And they said the reason why the owl is used in their, in their worship is because it is wise, because it is able to see things in the dark. There's a message there. The owl is wise because it sees things in the dark. And that's why the presidents and the heads of the uh, state and the heads of the, uh, uh, the, the government that we, we live under all meet at one o'clock or twelve o'clock at night uh, to worship the owl. And this you, is listen, if history. You, yeah, but if you don't believe it, if you don't believe it, we will come back and do another show, and Jordan will pull out the all picture. the pictures. Yes, I want to. And see you can pictures. zero in on Gerald Ford, who has some sort of satanic shrine in his home, as I understand it yeah. from uh, inside sources. Uh, I had talked to, uh, to one fellow at a. Uh, this was in Anaheim years ago at Knott's Berry Farm after a Billy James Hargis meeting who had claimed to be a yeah. member of some witch's covenant. He mentioned two congressmen which were involved in satanic cults and they were 
uh, I guess, warlocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I only remembered one, because he was the number one congressman for the Republican Party, the House Minority Leader, Gerald Ford, then later the selected non-elected president, who then selected the non-elected vice president, mm -hmm. Nelson Rockefeller. So we had a president and vice president of the United States that were not select, not elected by us, but selected by them. And if you take a look at the administrations of Ronald Reagan, who, who mm -hmm. said that Jimmy Carter was, should be criticized, or he criticized Carter for having had 18 members of the Council on Foreign Relations mm -hmm. and Trilateral uh, Commission appointed to key positions in his administration. Ronald Reagan had in excess of 200. He is as phony as a $3 bill. And Ronald and Reagan is not a right winger, folks. He is a phony. He is a phony. He was known in Hollywood he is as Red phony. Ronnie. Red Ronnie, yeah. It, Red it, Ronnie. You have indicated that this conspiracy uh, has some goal uh, by, that they want to accomplish by the year 2000. Yeah. I wonder if you could spell that right. out for now, me. I've done an article called Global 2000. There's a thing out there, and you've read it in Life magazine. You've seen the front cover of the NASA SETI program. I mean, you've seen the, the, the big uh, yeah, they, uh, the picture from outer space. And uh, you've ta they've talked about a $100 million investment, $100 million to invest to find out whether there is extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, there's, there's, they got something going here. You remember War of the Worlds? The radio broadcaster? Yes, by Orson Welles, 1939. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we've got something else coming in. They're going to make the announcement that they have discovered extraterrestrial intelligence. And this will frighten the people of the world. Say, oh, my God, how can we deal with this as a nation? But we can only deal with it you know, as the United Nations. Yes, we're going to have the United Nations, a one-world government. Yeah, it's necessary, they're going to say. It's absolutely necessary. Why? Tell me. To, to defend ourselves from those little green men, from the aliens that are out there. They will make that announcement. And the whole program is phony. It's fixed. It's set up. And you're going to be the patsy unless you understand what's going down and who's doing what to whom. And if you, and if you think that's uh, far, far-fetched, just remember that the Soviet Union was put before us in our media, in our television, in our radio, in our newspapers as being an evil empire, a frightening, powerful, evil, militaristic empire. Who can't and, even feed its own people. And now today we find it's like the Wizard of Oz. He comes out from behind the curtain. We find out they've been starving all their life. They can't even grow enough uh, uh, potatoes to make uh, vodka. They have to import the potatoes. They haven't even got a railroad uh, tr uh, track across their country. They're starving. They have always been starving. They're broke, and the only military materials they had is the stuff that we sent to them that we are not using anymore, shells of rockets, shells of planes, and it's just an evil empire on paper. Dwayne, you, They're you, starving. You ask about this Luciferian thing by the year 2000. I was concerned when they sent up the Galileo mission because they sent up the Galileo mission to explore uh, the planet Jupiter. That, was, that went up in 19, what is, uh, 87 or so? Seven. Something yeah. like that. It's already gone. It's on its way, folks. It's going to Jupiter. It's know. going to reach the planet by 1995. It's going to circle the planet. Mm -hmm. And then by 1999, it's going to be drawn into the planet where it will simply explode. What does it have on it? It's got 49 and a, and, a, and a quarter pounds of plutonium, enough for, well, let's say, 10 hydrogen bombs. What is the atmosphere of Jupiter made up of? Hydrogen. Now, this, if it were to be, if it were to be ignited, would give us a second sun. Right. And I thought, my God, the year 2000, a second sun. I said, where have I read that before? Something struck me. I said, wait a minute, Arthur C. Clarke, 2010, 2010, Odyssey 2, went back to the last uh, chapter. Guess what the last chapter is uh, called? Lucifer Rising. 
And he talks about the ignition of the planet Jupiter by the year 2010. And he said in the, at the very end of the book, you can read it, go to the library, pick it up, look at it. He said that the NASA space program was interested, uh, Dr. Robert uh, Jethro, I think mm -hmm. it was, or Jethro, was interested in this particular thesis for the Galileo mission. So we're talking about a space exploration program that not only is going to go, it went up. That was in 1982. This was sent up five years later. It's already on its way. If that thing ignites, <clears throat> it would give us a dual solar system. So what we're talking about is And they two would rename the planet from Jupiter to Lucifer. Right. And that's exactly what Arthur C. Clarke talks about in well, 2010. Know, I so know we're talking about Lucifer 2000. There'll be no more night time, so there'll be no more opportunity for crime at night. There will be more sun now because you have two suns now in, uh, in our uh, solar system. And the increase so of the increase growing, growing system, growing like system. the Matanuska Valley north of uh, uh, Anchorage. And this may in sound Alaska. pretty far fetched, but you had better uh, look at the facts. The fact is that this thing is carrying plutonium. It's going to Jupiter, and they know what it's going to do when it does, when it does crash. So and this NASA SETI program could <clears> be used as a vehicle to frighten the people of the planet into surrendering their sovereignty into accepting a one world government. And we've, we're talking about a thing, that, uh, a group out here called the Federal Emergency Management Association, right. which came in mass when the riots took place. They create chaos. As a then they fact, create no, control. Over the world headquarters in, in, in Switzerland of the world uh, Masonic headquarters for world Freemasonry, over the door is Ordo Ab Chao, which is Latin for order out of chaos. And all Freemasons know that term, Ordo Ab Chao. Order out of chaos. The concept is to create chaos, to create the problems. Then while the people are frightened to death of all the crime, <clears throat> and everything that seems to be out of control, a riotous situation, the government then moves in with justification. In order to put down this terrible chaos, they must have full power of the military, full obedience of the people to give the government full power to do whatever they want. That's why we're having all over the world wars, riots, bloodshed, famines, all kinds of things happening around the world. It's being manipulated. It's being orchestrated. Not just for Los it's Angeles. Conflict control. Conflict control. There's been more wars since the creation of the United Nations mm -hmm. than before the creation of the United Nations. More wars since 1945 to 1992 than from the beginning of time through, uh, through 19 to, uh, 1945. Let me explain this And the this people who created the, Council, uh, the United Nations were from the Council on Foreign Relations, yes. including Alger Hiss, the first secretary general of the United Nations Organizational Let Conference. Me when, friend, when, when fundamentalists kind of talk about their ideas are kind of parallel to this, uh, they at least have what they consider to be some ray of hope that Christ will come down and save us all or something like that. Right. Um, do you, do the two world. Of you in, in, individual whatever have any kind of hope or anything that we, you can yes, give us? The I'm, creation of a free world alliance. A free world alliance. A you know, free world what, alliance. What that? That's the creation of many, many, many different nations where individual rights and sovereignty is respected so that we can do our own thing in our own time. I'm talking about laissez-faire. I'm talking about free enterprise. Sounds like not corporate socialism like we have right now. Would, would it be fair to call you libertarian or not? I'm an anarcho-capitalist, anarcho libertarian, uh, quasi-conservative. Uh -huh. I believe in conserving not the status quo, but conserving freedom. And these freedoms that we have are drifting away. They're going through our, our fingers like water or sand. We've got to grasp hold of the Constitution. We have to <clears throat> use that document or we're going to lose it. And the problem is, is education. That's where the real power is, is in, in the educating of people. Uh, I have no, I, uh, myself, I'm not looking for anyone to come back, no Messiah to come back to help. I'm not looking to any of this. I, my belief is, is that 
uh, knowledge is the is the thing that's needed. People need to wake up and discover who is running their government, what the symbols of government mean, what these emblems mean. When they see the national coat of arms, the the the, um, the flags, the emblems, the seals, the symbols, all of these things mean something. Educate yourself. Find out where it came from. That's the only hope I see for the human race is the human race itself waking up to find out we've been had. You well, the oligarchy has, excuse me, yeah. but the oligarchy has a messiah, Lord Maitreya. I call him Lord Betraya, yeah. who's wrapped in with a theosophical society, wrapped in with all of this Luciferian crap. Yeah. You go up to, to a little Satan place, Ojai Valley, and I was raised up there in Ojai Valley. You're going to find the Blavatskyites, and you're going to find... Uh, the uh, uh, Krishna, no, uh, Krishna Murti uh, yeah. group right next uh, next door in the Meditation Mountain, and I believe they're going to try to introduce this Lord Maitreya as the Jesus, the Buddha, the uh, uh, as the new Muhammad. Uh, he, he's going to be all things to all people, and they're going to be talking about a global government, and we have to unify. We have to bring, d dissolve all of our differences and sort of come into one amalgamated, homogenized group. Let me, let me also bring out that Adam Weishaupt in his writings uh, talked about if, if a group wanted to take over the world, and, and, and which would be a totally impossible mission, but if they, and incidentally, that's where we get Mission Impossible from Impossible Mission Force, which uh, if you remember in the movie, Impossible Mission Force was IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund, and the Impossible Mission Force was always working for the government, uh, overthrowing kings, rulers, and princes, but of course the government had no, nothing to do with it. And they but they were the bad guys, yeah, and yeah. the one world... <laughs> Uh, and, oligarchies are the good guys, of course. Yeah, and then, right? and television has been doing this for years. Then they have movies like Get Smart, Get Smart. And in Get Smart, what did you have? You had the two sides, chaos and control. Again, we have ordo ob chaos. Uh, chaos and control. That's the way you get control is by causing chaos. It's Hegelian so, politics. They, Hegelian they dialectics. The right. illusionary right, the Nazis, National Socialists, and the communists. Now, the Nazis believed in total government. The communists believed in total government. You say, well, oh, gee, I'm not over there. I'm sort of down the middle, and you're half Nazi, half communist. <laughs> uh, Adolf Hitler said, basically, National Socialism and Marxism are the same. Yeah. He said that on February 5th, 1941. He said they're, they're the identical. same. Absolutely. So what I'm saying is that uh, when you get back to the original symbol, symbols and emblems of the secret societies, and you understand, as Adam Weishaupt wrote, which is what I was going to bring out, Adam Weishaupt wrote that the one thing that will bring all nations together, all peoples together, because there's so much differences between races and individuals, but the one thing all individuals will come together for is to save their own hide. So if you can create enough bloodshed, enough violence, enough anarchy, if you can finance, organize, and direct it correctly, to, to cause enough civil uh, unrest and civil right uh, law unrest. How about creating a new world order by creating what? The illusion that there are men from outer space. There won't be simply a war of the world. This is a war that is declared <coughs> against the world, and that's what they're trying to bring about. If you take a look at the background of George Bush, Take a look at the background of Adolf Hitler. Where did he get his money? Senator Adolf Prescott yeah. Bush was involved as the, the, the chief man at Brown Brothers Harriman. Brown Brothers Harriman was involved in the financing of Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler... So was General Motors, in. General Electric, uh, uh, Standard DuPont, Oil. Standard Oil. All of these corporations got to be large corporations because they were financing both sides during the Second World War. And that's that it's means, conflict uh, control. It's conflict. Yeah, World it's called War conflict II control. was engineered. Wars like bridges are engineered. They're created. You don't think the people that own this doesn't Ford, happen by accident. You don't think the people who r run the Ford Motor Company or General Electric get up in the morning and and have their meeting and decide what they're going to do today. Well, we can only hope. No, <laughs> they don't plan what they're going to do today. People, they have they have highly trained people who know what the company is going to be doing 10 years from today. They have an agenda. 
They know how, many, how much oil is going to be needed 10 years from today, how much rubber, how much glass. They have to know these things. You have to plan for an international corporation's 10, 20 years ahead of time. And if you think they do it, you have to know that this government does it. And when, if you, when and the if you tomb, understand you know, that things are planned for the future. When the tomb at Yale University was violated, when they broke in, they went into one room and here's all of this Nazi paraphernalia. This is the, the attorney Yale University. where George Bush laid nude in the coffin, was born again into the <coughs> satanic order. They go into one room. Here's all of the Nazi paraphernalia. Jimmy Carter, refer, Jimmy Carter used to talk about how he was thrice born, and all the Christians said, oh, that means he was born again. Right. No, he said thrice born. Freemasons know what that means. If you're an occultist or into Freemasonry, you know what the term thrice born means. And got a thing to do with Christianity. It means that you have been initiated into the secret society. Okay, we're, we're running out of time uh, quickly here. And um, we're running you know, out of time as a nation. Yeah. Well, this is, this is certainly a tall order. I mean, I used to think that uh, Campus Crusade's Jesus 2000 was a bit far-fetched to win the world to Christ. And now I'm hearing all this. this is well, weird. they want to win the world for Satan. Yeah. They want a Luciferian 2000 program in their initiative. Talk, we're talking right. about the Illuminati, not, not the Campus Crusade. What we program. need to do <laughs> right. is incite right. a revelation to avoid a revolution. Okay. Jordan, we can see him on Ancient Mysteries of the Bible, Part 2, coming up sometime next sometime year. Probably in March or whatever. And uh, we can hear Anthony Hilder on Radio Free World. I'd like to thank the two of you for coming here, and I'd like to invite you to come back when you got some pictures and stuff that you could show Absolutely. me, because I, I, I'd love to see some of these pictures. We will come back with pictures. Jordan's got them all. Yep. I'll tell you I, I want to see Gerald Ford in a Klan uniform. Okay. i got to see that. Okay. It's a okay. black Klansman outfit. All right. that uh, Campus Crusade. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you think you've had enough, don't you ever, ever tune into this program again, because in my estimation, there's no such thing as enough, and I'm going to continue to shove this down your throats until you understand it. For those of you who want more, listen to the hour of the time every Monday through Friday night. This is, this is evidence of double-mindedness. This is evidence of the fact that we don't really understand how we the people are being manipulated by the powers that be, the high cabal, the forces of evil. If you want to try to put a definite label on it, you're going to play into the hands of the organism itself. You cannot say that this is an Illuminati conspiracy. And I said it's not just only science and Illuminati conspiracy. Everybody who thinks it is, they oh, he tried to cover up. Good night, folks. And God bless each and every single one of you. Good evening. I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to the Hour of the Time. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz. We're going to have perfect government. Perfect government is coming soon, and I'm looking forward to it. What you have just heard, ladies and gentlemen, is the age-old dream of Mystery Babylon, the secret societies, Freemason, the Knights Templars, the Knights of Malta, the ancient order of the Rosen Cross, the age-old dream of a perfect government, permanent utopia upon this earth. What is Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz? talking about this 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite and member of the branch 
of Mystery Babylon known as the Mormon Church. What is he talking about? Ladies and gentlemen, that's the subject of tonight's broadcast. It is known as the Secret Kingdom. Investigative reporter Jeffrey Kay concluded, quote, The Mormon Church, this American Zion, wields more economic power more effectively than the State of Israel or the Pope in Rome, unquote. Actually, dear listeners, the word church is misleading when applied to Mormondom, for the power structure controlling its staggering resources is organized for the kind of absolute authoritarianism that one usually associates with a cult and not with a responsible church, nor are the ultimate goals of the brethren compatible with the normal aims of Christian leaders. In fact, in no way, shape, or form can the Mormon church be called Christian. They are essentially the same as those of cults in general, and especially those of secret revolutionary groups working toward a takeover of the world. As one former teacher at Brigham Young University has said, I quote, The Mormons do intend to take over the world. There is no secret about that. It's in the writings of Joseph Smith right on down. The Constitution of the United States will hang by a thread, and the Church will save it by establishing a theocracy, unquote. Any who think the Mormon kingdom is a democracy are under a delusion. In fact, it is a dictatorship ruled by its inner elite circle, a council of elders. As the front page of the Wall Street Journal recently said, quote, Today, from their 28-story marble and glass, unquote, church headquarters building in Salt Lake City, Mormon church leaders oversee a vast and growing world financial empire, unquote. From these offices, their dictatorial control reaches out to every church level and into every facet of Mormon life. Whatever vote there seems to be at the ward, stake, and individual levels is part of a cleverly contrived illusion that continues to deceive millions of Mormons into imagining that they actually have some say in church affairs. Although they do have the freedom to disagree with their leaders, to do so means excommunication and damnation. Excommunicated for openly disagreeing with the Brethren's position on ERA, Sonia Johnson has said this, quote, The Mormon Church has become more powerful than we dare believe. It's downright terrifying, especially when you see how rich and influential it is. I really think if we could ever get an investigation, it would uncover something so like Watergate, it would blow everything wide open, unquote. Totalitarian, theocratic communism seems to be the goal. Saints Alive was recently involved in some litigation arising out of a physical attack upon one of its missionaries by an LDS, or Latter-day Saints, tour guide on the street just outside Salt Lake City's Temple Square. In an interrogatory exchange, the surprising response by the Mormon Church revealed that it was an unincorporated association without assets. Let me repeat that. Without assets. All wealth and power is owned and controlled by the closely held Corporation of the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Incorporated. You see, folks, church members who have faithfully and sacrificially contributed their tithes, time, and energy are absolutely powerless to demand an accounting or to change a single action by the First Presidency, even if all 5.2 million of them stood up in unison and voted unanimously for it. The startling fact, folks, is that Mormon church members have no vote or participation of any kind in the corporate entity that controls Mormondom. They can sincerely perform their functions as bishops, elders, high priests, and Sunday school superintendents all they wish. But in the real world, the real world of legal ownership and raw power, they are only 5.2 million pawns. Pawns, fools, if you will, subject to manipulation from the top. All of this is part of a secret kingdom that Jeffrey Kay has called the, quote, invisible empire, unquote, and about which most Mormons have only the vaguest notions, if they have any notion at all. 
This theocracy is alluded to by Apostle Bruce R. McConkie. Quote, through this church and kingdom, a framework has been built through which the full government of God will eventually operate, unquote. That, quote, full government of God, unquote, involves what is known as, quote, united order, unquote. Revelations that came through Joseph Smith described it as a theocratic, communistic society. All property and income was to be given over to the control of the church and then distributed to everyone according to his need, as the brethren defined it, so that, quote, the poor shall be exalted in that the rich are made low, unquote. Those who transgressed were to be put out of the church, in which case the property they had given into the treasury would not be returned to them. Serious problems prevented full implementation of the, quote, united order, unquote. You see, until now, it never really worked. However, the Mormon church still looks forward to the day when these revelations of God through the prophet will be fulfilled and Mormon theocratic communism firmly established worldwide. And that can only happen when the church has taken full political power. When that time comes, woe to all who transgress the laws of the Mormon gospel. Excommunication with loss of earthly property will be supplemented, ladies and gentlemen, with the death penalty. The United Order is in reality the total makeup of the full body of the Illuminati. All of the different organizations will come together to rule the world. There is a doctrine, an ancient pagan doctrine, of blood atonement connected to the Mormon Church. And since the early days of the Church, it has always been Norman doctrine that, quote, under certain circumstances, there are some serious sins for which the cleansing of Christ does not operate. And the law of God is that men must then have their own blood shed to atone for their sins, unquote. It is generally thought that these serious sins are in the category of murder and adultery. However, this is not clearly defined in Mormonism. Brigham Young, a 33rd degree Freemason, said that, quote, any man or woman who violates the covenants made with their God will be required to pay the debt. The blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it, unquote. In the same general vein, President J. M. Grant declared, quote, If they are covenant breakers, we need a place designated where we can shed their blood, unquote. You see, folks, my prophecy on the hour of the time that human sacrifice would return to the world will be fulfilled, unless we are smart enough to stop it. Besides murder and adultery, blood atonement was also advocated for stealing and taking the name of the Lord in vain. Likewise, the penalty for marrying an African, quote, under the law of God is death on the spot. This will also be so, unquote. The Mormon Church is now and has always been a white, Aryan, racist organization, and until recently, when threatened with lawsuits, they never allowed any other race than white Caucasians to belong. That's right, folks. And if you are in black American who belongs to the Mormon Church, you have really been fooled. All of the secret organizations of Mystery Babylon are racist organizations. The 1978 decision opening the priesthood to blacks didn't change that law. Blood atonement was also required for lying or damning old Joe Smith or his religion. I guess that tells you what's going to happen to me. But what about other liars, like Bobo Gritz? Does it apply to him? Or is he excused if he is working in the furtherance of the great work or the great plan? That most serious of all crimes, apostasy, bears the death penalty, and those who kill an apostate are saving his soul. This is a real concern of ex-Mormons. Many have received death threats, and some have even been shot at recently. Brigham Young was very firm on this subject, as the following excerpt from one of his sermons, as reported in Journal of Discourses, indicates. 
quote, I say, rather than that apostates should flourish here, I will unsheath my bowie knife and conquer or die. Great commotion erupted in the congregation, and a simultaneous burst of feeling assented to the declaration. And he continues, Now, you nasty apostates, clear out, or judgment will be put to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And you can hear voices generally saying, Go it, go it! And he continues, If you say it is right, raise your hands. All hands in the congregation were raised. And he continues, Let us call upon the Lord to assist us in this and every good work. Unquote. You see, folks, the doctrine of blood atonement was practiced in Utah prior to statehood until the Mormon leadership realized that they must obey federal laws or have them enforced by the United States Army, and that's the only thing that stopped it from being practiced in the open. It was, for many years, continued in secret, and there are many who swear today that it is still being carried out. There are rumors that this doctrine is still practiced secretly in Utah. It would be strange, if it were not, for Mormons boast that they of all people, quote, practice what they believe, unquote. And as Joseph Fielding Smith said, blood atonement, quote, is scriptural doctrine and is taught in all the standard works of the church, unquote. Certainly, church leaders would openly carry this out today if they could. In fact, the Utah State Legislature, with its Mormon majority, has succeeded in legalizing one method of practicing blood atonement. Utah is the only state where the condemned may elect to be executed by a firing squad which causes his own blood to be shed, and thus, by Mormon beliefs, atones for his sins. The execution by a firing squad of condemned murderer Gary Gilmore, who was a Mormon, was a recent example. Brigham Young made blood atonement sound like a generous provision that the guilty would willingly embrace and the executioners gladly perform, quote, in love, unquote. Brigham Young said this, quote, Now take a person who knows that by having his blood shed he will atone for that sin. Is there a man or woman in this house but what would say, Shed my blood that I may be saved and exalted with the gods? He would be glad to have his blood shed. I could refer to plenty of instances where men have been righteously slain in order to atone for their sins. This is loving our neighbors as ourselves. If he wants salvation, and it is necessary to spill his blood on the earth in order that he may be saved, spill it. That is the way to love mankind, unquote. Regardless of the understanding of the average Mormon, the brethren look forward to the day when they will once again be able to practice openly not only polygamy, but blood atonement. When will that day come? In answer to that question, Bruce R. McConkie has written, quote, This doctrine can only be practiced in its fullness in a day when the civil and ecclesiastical laws are administered in the same hands, unquote. If the Mormon Church should ever succeed in taking over the world, Mormonism, in its most fanatical and bizarre practices, will become the rule enforced unbendingly upon everyone. Dare anyone call this a conspiracy? Thinking he was denying it, one Mormon recently told us, quote, This isn't a conspiracy, it's our destiny, unquote. As with polygamy in the past, the obsessive ambition of world domination is openly denied today, but secretly plotted. Though less blatantly proclaimed, the ultimate goal hasn't changed since the early days when Mormon leaders brazenly boasted, as First Presidency member Heber C. Kimball declared in 1859, quote, The nations will bow to this kingdom sooner or later, and all hell cannot help it, unquote. The global goal, ladies and gentlemen, is a one-world government, as it is with all the branches of the Illuminati. Of course, Mormon leaders call their empire the kingdom of God. However, their God is an extraterrestrial from Kolob, definitely not the God of the Bible. And the, quote, Zion, unquote, to which their spirit brother of Lucifer, Jesus Christ, will return to reign, is Independence, Missouri. Most Christians believe, as the Bible declares, that Christ will return to Jerusalem, Israel, to establish his millennial kingdom, whereas Mormons believe that they must establish a worldwide Mormon kingdom dictated from their Missouri base in order to make it possible for Christ to return. Therein lies a great difference, which is why the Mormon hierarchy, beginning with Joseph Smith himself, has always had worldwide and absolute political power as its goal. 
Mormon historian Klaus J. Hansen has written, quote, The idea of a political kingdom of God promulgated by a secret council of fifty is by far the most important key to an understanding of the Mormon past, unquote. Mormon writer John J. Stewart has said, quote, The prophet established a confidential council of fifty, our yiftif, Fifty spelled backwards, comprised of both Mormons and non-Mormons, to help attend to temporal matters, including the eventual development of a one-world government in harmony with preparatory plans for the second advent of the Savior, unquote. The close relationship between Masonry, the Mormon priesthood, and Joseph Smith's growing ambition to rule the world in order to bring Christ back has been pointed out by a number of Mormon writers. Like the temple ceremonies, the secret council of fifty grew out of Freemasonry. The prophet's divine revelation about the political kingdom of God came just three weeks after the Nauvoo Masonic Lodge was installed and Smith became a master mason. These men were all members of the priesthood. They all wore special robes and the records of their meetings were often burned. Those that remain in the possession of the church today are not available even for church historians to peruse. In 1884, Mormon spokesman Elder Lunt said, quote, We look forward with perfect confidence to the day when we will hold the reins of the United States government. After that, we expect to control the continent, unquote. This secret organization was referred to in a, quote, writ issued for the arrest of prominent citizens of Nauvoo for treasonable designs against the state, unquote. Numerous sources report that shortly before his death, Joseph Smith was crowned by this secret council as king over the Mormon kingdom that he believed was destined to control the world. Not only was Joseph Smith crowned, quote, king on the earth, unquote, but so were Brigham Young and John Taylor. The authority claimed even today for Mormondom's, quote, living prophet, unquote, is still that of an absolute monarch or dictator. One of the greatest authorities on Mormon doctrine, Apostle Bruce R. McConkie, has said, quote, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as it is now constituted, is the kingdom of God on earth. The Church is not a democracy, but a kingdom. And the president of the Church, the mouthpiece of God on earth, is the earthly king, unquote. I wonder what the Pope has to say about that. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, there is a secret government. The current importance of all of this ambition to rule the world is evident in the secret oath still taken by each Mormon going through the temple ceremonies, a ceremony through which Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz has publicly exalted in one such oath, the patron, quote, consecrates, unquote, all he owns, earns, and is, quote, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for the building up of the kingdom of God on earth and for the establishment of Zion, unquote. In the, quote, law of sacrifice, unquote, temple patrons swear even to sacrifice their lives to this cause. This is not what Christians think of as the kingdom of God to be established by Christ himself, but as Mormon writer J.D. Williams has pointed out, it involves, quote, a secret government responsible not to the governed, but to the ecclesiastical authority, which will provide benign rule for all people without election, unquote. That most Mormons are not aware of the real purpose behind Mormonism doesn't change the facts. Mormon researcher Klaus Hansen's comments are of interest. Quote, Even among the Mormons, few were themselves aware of the revolutionary implications inherent in the concept of the political kingdom of God as taught by their prophet Joseph Smith to a small group of faithful followers after he had initiated them into a secret council of fifty in the spring of 1844. Indeed, if few Mormons in 1844 knew what kind of kingdom their prophet had organized that year, fewer know today. The fact that so few Mormons themselves, to say nothing of non-Mormons, know the truth about Mormonism today reflects the secrecy involved and the apparent intention of its leaders, unquote. Is so much of Mormonism plotted and practiced in secret because the brethren know it can only be, quote, sold, unquote, under false labels? Can Mormons reasonably expect the world to convert to a religion that is so dishonestly and secretly presented and much of it held back in secret because it is so, quote, sacred, unquote? 
If Mormons are indeed, quote, the only true Christ Christians, unquote, then let them emulate the founder of Christianity who said, quote, I spake openly to the world, and in secret have I said nothing, unquote. The corruption is, of course, as always, rooted in power. History confirms common sense in bearing witness that whenever the absolute control which the brethren wield has rested for very long in human hands, the results have been tragic. The Bible declares that the heart of every human is, quote, deceitful above all things, and is desperately wicked, unquote. This applies to the brethren as well as to everyone else. The worst despots in history have been those who claimed to be divine, and this is because humans were never intended to exercise godlike power and control either over themselves or over others. Man is inherently flawed. The concept that imperfect man can rule imperfect man in a thousand years of utopian peace on this earth is ludicrous. When they attempt it, disaster results as surely as night follows day. Much of the dishonest unwillingness to face facts unfavorable to their religion and the gullible willingness to believe the most outrageous lies that Mormons themselves admit is endemic among them can be traced to their belief that they are in the process of becoming, quote, gods, unquote. You see, they are just another branch of Mystery Babylon. How can a, quote, God, unquote, ever be wrong? Surely the temptation to live by the adage, quote, the end justifies the means, unquote, would be overpowering for anyone who really believes that his, quote, end, unquote, will be the, quote, exaltation, unquote, to, quote, godhood, unquote. Under the grandiose dream that they are the God-makers, Mormonism's leaders have developed an utter contempt for truth when it conflicts with their goal of extending the Mormon kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ to encompass the entire world. As the absolute leaders of Mormonism, the brethren have rewritten revelations, suppressed facts, promoted fraud, honored false prophets, misrepresented their true beliefs and practices, and pretended to a divine authority, which they obviously do not have. In order to control those under them and ensnare fresh millions in Mormonism, Though their religious zeal may be genuine, they have divorced their faith from truth and built an earthly empire upon the insistence that their followers dare not think for themselves or examine facts, but must blindly obey whatever the brethren decree. And this brings up some extremely grave questions. Mormonism seems as American as apple pie, and Mormons seem to be the perfect citizens with their close families, high morals, patriotism, Boy Scout programs, tabernacle choir, and conservative politics. A Los Angeles Times article implied that Mormons have recently gained the image of, quote, super Americans who appear to many to be more American than the average American, unquote, make no mind that the LA Times is mostly owned by the Mormon Church. This may explain why such a high proportion of Mormons find their way into government. Returned LDS missionaries have, quote, the three qualities the Central Intelligence Agency wants, foreign language ability, training in a foreign country, and former residence in a foreign country, unquote. Utah, and particularly Brigham Young University, is one of the prime recruiting areas for the Central Intelligence Agency. According to Brigham Young University spokesman Dr. Gary Williams, quote, we've never had any trouble placing anyone who has applied to the Central Intelligence Agency. Every year they take almost anybody who applies, unquote. He also admitted that this has created problems with a number of foreign countries who have complained about the, quote, pretty good dose of Mormon missionaries who have gone back to the countries they were in as Central Intelligence Agents, unquote. This may at least partially explain the reported close tie between the Mormon Church and the CIA. A disproportionate number of Mormons arrive at the higher levels of the CIA, FBI, military intelligence, armed forces, and all levels of city, state, and federal governments, including the Senate, Congress, Cabinet, and White House staff. Sincere and loyal citizens, most of them, may be unaware of the secret ambition of the brethren. 
What could be better than having such patriots as these serving in strategic areas of government and national security? Unfortunately, dear listeners, as we have noticed in every other area of Mormonism, the real truth lies hidden beneath the seemingly ideal image of patriotism presented by Mormons in public service. Take, for instance, Bobo Gritz. In fact, their very presence in responsible government positions, particularly in agencies dealing with national security, raises some extremely grave questions that were expressed by Ed Decker in the following letter mailed to the addressees. Quote, An open letter to the President, First Presidency, and members of the General Authorities of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, dated August 21, 1980. Gentlemen, I was recently reflecting that although the actual blood oaths and the oath of vengeance were removed from the temple ceremony sometime after 1930, you gentlemen, listing ten of the above, are of an age to have received your own endowments prior to their removal and therefore are still under these oaths. I am particularly interested in your personal position on your oath of vengeance against the United States of America. As you recall, the oath was basically as follows. You and each of you do solemnly promise and vow that you will pray and never cease to importune high heaven to avenge the blood of the prophets Joseph and Hiram Smith on this nation, and that you will teach this to your children and your children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Have you officially renounced this oath? Or are you still bound by it? If you have not renounced it, how can you presume to lead four and one half million people under item 12 of your articles of faith and still be bound to call upon heaven to heap curses upon our nation? We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. And that's a quote directly from item 12 of the articles of faith. If you have renounced it, how can you justify having sworn such an oath to the most holy of holy places on this earth before the sacred altar of your omnipotent God and then renounce it? Gentlemen, I call upon you to repent of this abomination and proclaim to both the Mormon people and to the people of the United States of America that you renounce that oath and all it represents. I also call upon all members of the Mormon Church who hold office in our government, serve in the armed services, work for the FBI and CIA, who have gone through the Mormon Temple and sworn oaths of obedience and sacrifice to the Church and its leaders to repent of these oaths in the light of the obvious conflict of of men who are sworn to seek vengeance against this great nation. Sincerely signed, J. Edward Decker. He sent a copy to President Jimmy Carter and Mr. Ronald Reagan. No response, ladies and gentlemen, no response was ever received to this letter. The brethren are so powerful that they are immune to criticism and feel no need to explain themselves or account to anyone for their actions. And this seems to be the same, the same feeling of Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrights, who attacked me physically in Salt Lake City at the Salt Dome and yelled at the top of his voice, quote, You will not criticize me, Cooper, unquote. And I say, Bobo Grits, you can stick it where the sun doesn't shine. The Mormon Church already packs a political punch far out of proportion to its size. Recently, the Wall Street Journal explained how, in spite of the constitutional separation between church and state, public schools in Utah are used to instill Mormonism in young minds. You see, in the state of Utah, it is already a theocracy. It mentioned political reapportionment, airline deregulation, the basing of the MX missile and the ERA as recent political issues affected by the power of the church. For example, when the church opposed the MX for Utah, those plans were immediately dropped by the federal government. The same Wall Street Journal article quoted the following statement from J.D. Williams, a University of Utah political science professor. Quote, There is a disquieting statement in Mormonism. When the leaders have spoken, the thinking has been done. To me, democracy cannot thrive in that climate. They don't have to be called to church headquarters for political instruction. They know what they're supposed to do. That's why non-Mormons can only look toward the Mormon church and wonder. What is Big Brother doing to me today? Unquote. 
But, ladies and gentlemen, there is a more disturbing possibility. While the election of a Mormon president seems unlikely, it is highly probable under the present swing toward conventional morality and conservatism that a Mormon could one day become a Republican vice presidential nominee. This is especially true when one considers the growing cooperation between Mormons and the moral majority. With the power, wealth, wide influence, numerous highly placed Mormons, and large voting bloc under their virtual control, the Brethren have a great deal to offer a Republican presidential candidate. Let's assume that a Mormon vice presidential candidate is on the winning ticket and thereafter the president dies in office or is assassinated, causing the Mormon to succeed him as president of the United States. And we know that the order assassinated John F. Kennedy in the outdoor temple of the sun known as Dealey Plaza. We also know that the clamor for a savior in the United States of America is reaching unprecedented proportions and many are looking many are looking to H. Ross Perot, who will cast around and maybe, maybe choose someone like Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrites as his vice presidential running mate. Or is it possible that Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrites could himself be elected to the presidency of the United States of America in this climate of absolute chaos which the Order, the Illuminati, has created with the help of people like Tom Valentine and organizations like the Liberty Lobby? Is this a possibility? Are you listening to me, sheeple? There is every reason to believe that the new president would immediately begin to gather around him increasing numbers of zealous temple Mormons in strategic places at the highest levels of government. A crisis similar to the one which Mormon prophecies, quote, foretold, unquote, occurs in which millions of Mormons with their year's supply of food, guns, and ammunition play a key role. It would be a time of excitement and zealous effort by the saints to fulfill Joseph Smith's and Brigham Young's, quote, prophecy, unquote. Quote, the time will come when the destiny of the nation will hang upon a single thread. At that critical juncture, this people will step forth and save it from the threatened destruction, unquote. Not only does Mormonism predict the, quote, saving, unquote, of America, but the precedent for an attempted takeover by force of subterfuge through political means has been set by the founding prophet himself. In 1834, Joseph Smith organized an army and marched toward Independence, Missouri, to, quote, redeem Zion, end quote, in spite of a humiliating surrender to the Missouri militia that proved his bold prophecies false and therefore that he could not possibly be a real prophet, as the Mormon church proclaims, ignoring that a prophet cannot possibly be wrong. The prophet later formed the Nauvoo Legion and commissioned himself a lieutenant general to command it. Lyman L. Woods stated, quote, I have seen him on a white horse wearing the uniform of a general. He was leading a parade of the legion and looked like a god, unquote. Joseph Smith was not only ordained king on earth, but he ran for president of the United States just before his death, at which time Mormon missionaries across the country became, quote, a vast force of political power, unquote. Today's church leaders are urging Mormons to prepare themselves for the coming crisis in order to succeed where past saints have failed. A recent major article in Ensign about being prepared included this oft-repeated warning reminder. Quote, The commandment to reestablish Zion became for the saints of Joseph Smith's day the central goal of the church, but it was a goal the church did not realize because its people were not fully prepared. Unquote. Going back, ladies and gentlemen, going back to our hypothetical crisis, what Mormons unsuccessfully attempted against impossible odds in the past, they might very well accomplish with much better odds in this future scenario. They are building a hero, a demagogue, someone who could well become a vice president and will, in fact, be a presidential candidate 
Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrice, and under cover of the national and international crisis, the Mormon President of the United States acts boldly and decisively to assume dictatorial powers. With the help of the brethren and Mormons everywhere, he appears to save America and becomes a national hero. At this time, he is made prophet and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Mormon Kingdom of God, while still president of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no provision in the Constitution to prevent this. With the government largely in the hands of increasing numbers of Mormon appointees at all levels throughout the United States, the constitutional prohibition against the establishment of a state church would no longer be enforceable. Mormon prophecies and the curse upon which the United States government in revenge for the blood of Joseph and Hiram Smith would seemingly have been fulfilled. In effect, the United States would have become a theocracy exactly as planned by the Brethren, completing the first step in the Mormon takeover of the world. President John Taylor boasted of it 100 years ago. He said, quote, Let us now notice our political position in the world. What are we going to do? We are going to possess the earth and reign over it forever and ever. Of course, he was speaking for the collective secret brotherhood known as the Illuminati. Now ye kings and emperors, help yourselves if you can. This is the truth, and it may as well be told at this time as at any other. There's a good time coming, saints, a good time coming, unquote. But there's a more likely scenario. While the beginning and meat of this program presents an extremely disturbing possibility. It may seem highly speculative and improbable. There is another scenario, however, which is equally disturbing, but is much more likely, and if you've been listening to our series on the mysteries, you will understand it immediately. It arises from the fact that Mormonism is actually part of something much, much larger we have already noted that the revelations that Joseph Smith received, far from being unique, were in fact very similar, if not identical, to the basic philosophy underlying many occult groups and secret revolutionary societies. Thus far in history, these numerous occult revolutionary organizations have remained largely separate and in competition with one another. If something should happen to unite them, dear listeners, and at the same time their beliefs should gain worldwide acceptance, as in the New Age movement, a new and unimaginably powerful force for world revolution would have come into existence. There is, in fact, increasing evidence of a new and growing secular religious ecumenism pervasive and persuasive enough to accomplish this unprecedented and incalculable, powerful coalition. It could be the means of creating the one world government that has not only been the long-standing hope and plan of the Brethren and many other occult revolutionary leaders in Freemasonry and other secret organizations supposedly existing for the good of the community, but is increasingly gaining a wide acceptance through New Age Networks as the only viable option to a nuclear holocaust and our ecological collapse. Improbable, perhaps, dear listeners, but certainly it can no longer be summarily dismissed as impossible. After listening to this broadcast, you should have a much clearer understanding of the world of the Mormon Church, of what's happening in the United States, of the many different organizations veiled. We're behind this veil. Those who consider themselves to be illumined continue to work toward their great dream of an earthly utopia which they call the plan, the great society, the great work, it has been their dream for millennia. It is nothing new, as those of you who have listened to the entire series that we have done on the hour of the time, known as the Mystery Schools, 
or Mystery Babylon have discovered. Now, please understand that we are discussing the hierarchy of the Mormon Church, not Mormons. I know many Mormons who are good, upstanding, patriot citizens of this country. They have no knowledge of this. In fact, as the members of every other church and every other religion practice on this earth, they believe mostly through blind faith and never question. They do not know the basic facts of the truth or falsity of their dogma, nor do they generally care. And even if they knew, which many of them do know and understand, they would not renounce it and walk away, for they would become a pariah in their own society. And in the state of Utah, to renounce the Mormon Church could be a death sentence. Now, should you think this absolutely absurd, I recently took a trip through the state of Utah, through the Long Valley. There is a small city called Orderville. Now, if you know what I know, and if you've been listening to this program, you know some of what I know. You know that I would have had to stop to find out why that city was called Orderville. I did, and I was amazed, for it is no secret there that it was the first communist settlement established in the United States by the Mormon Church. These facts are freely admitted in the city, and in fact they take great pride in the history of their little town. It was the first communist government community established by the Mormon Church in their search in their search for their promised land, which eventually became Salt Lake City. It was established and named after a secret organization known as the Order, to which the elders of the community belonged. You can even see it, the history, the same history that I've just given to you, on the signs at the rest stops entering and leaving the town. You can get more of the history by visiting the small historical society in Orderville. It is a fact. And now, ladies and gentlemen, remember this. This program did not just come from my research or from just the research of Kaji, although our research follows what you have heard tonight letter for letter and word for word. But so that you would understand that I am not crazy. Tonight's program was taken from chapter 16 of a book which you can purchase yourself or order from your book store. The name of this book is The God Makers. The God Makers, written by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt. It is called The God Makers. It is written by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt. Tonight's program came from chapter 16. It's published by Harvest House Publishers, Eugene, Oregon, 97402. That's The God Makers, written by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt. Published by Harvest House Publishers, Eugene, Oregon, 97402. I recommend that you get this book and read it cover to cover and understand that the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence and me personally in my own research have confirmed every single word in this book. It is fact. As for Bobo Gritz, we here at Kaji and the Hour of the Time have already proven to you in his own words that he is a liar. And we have many tapes that we have not played, and we will continue to do so until you, the sheeple, wake up. In the symbology of the temples of Freemasonry, the Mormon Church 
and all along the highways in the state of Utah, you can see one of the most common symbols of that secret organization, which we know collectively as the Illuminati. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Beehive. Good night, and God bless you all. Welcome. Once again, you're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And folks, I'll be in the San Francisco Bay Area, October 29th through the 31st, at the Dunphy Hotel, San Mateo, California. The number to call is area code 415-905-8874. That's area code 415-905-8874. 8874 A uh, let me see I'll be doing a lecture on Sunday October the 31st at uh, 12:30 p.m. also a workshop later that same afternoon October the 31st at 3:30 p.m. But I'll be there the whole weekend we'll have a booth we'll have tapes of the hour of the time there they'll be at a reduced rate because you won't have to pay postage and uh, my book will be available, and of course I'll be there if you just want to stop by and chat for a while. Remember, that's the Dunphy Hotel, San Mateo, California, October 29th through the 31st. The number to call is area code 415-905-8874. For those of you in the southeast segment of the United States. I will be in Atlanta, Georgia on November the 14th. I will be speaking in the Shambly Community Center um, on that date, and the number to call is area code 404-986-0802. Once again, November the 14th in Atlanta, Georgia, I'll be speaking at the Shambly Community Center the number to call for information is area code 404-986-0802. Now, both of these uh, uh, events in San Mateo and in Atlanta, Georgia, cost some money. I don't know exactly how much because I'm an invited speaker. You need to call those numbers and talk to them. But as usual, when I get there, I will arrange for a lower rate for CAGI members. Make sure you bring your welcoming letter, anything signed by me, or your press credentials, and uh, that will be good for your discount. If you have any problems, come and see me personally. I'll verify that you're a CAGI member and make sure that you get your discount. Well, folks, tonight is going to be illuminating. I can tell you that for sure. Let me tell you first, right off the bat, before we get into the subject of tonight's broadcast, that the media corporation, well, first let me give you what happened on the stock exchange since we've been talking about this, all the stock for all the media corporations that we've discussed, including the Inquirer Star Group, has gone up. Uh, So it shows that somebody may be doing a little anticipatory buying out there, or it could just be an accident. Um, The uh, stock that we're going to purchase closed today on the New York Stock Exchange at 51 and 5 eighths dollars per share. That's 51 and 5 eighths dollars per share. The name of the corporation is the Gannett Company Incorporated. Seek out the lowest commissioned broker in your area, ladies and gentlemen. Buy as much stock in that company as you possibly can. The New York Stock Exchange symbol is GCI. GCI. Again, it's Gannett Company Incorporated. You want to make sure to tell your broker that you want to purchase only voting shares. Only voting shares. Do not buy stock unless the stock is voting shares. Make sure that you understand that perfectly. As soon as you purchase your stock, Make Xerox copies of your stock certificates. Make sure your broker knows to issue the certificates in your name. That way you know that you own the stock. You have the shares in your possession. Make Xerox copies of the shares. Send them to us with a stamped, self-addressed number 10 envelope. We will send you back a proxy uh, statement, which you will need to fill out, have notarized, and send back to us, giving us the proxy vote for your shares of stock. 
So, folks, you can get started on that tomorrow morning. Um, we will be keeping you updated. We'll tell you uh, if uh, stock starts going up too precipitous, we'll tell you to hold off and uh, until it comes back down. But this is not going to take uh, a week or two. It's going to take us some time to do it. You need to motivate your neighbors, your friends. You need to get them involved. You make to make them understand what we're doing. And tell them if they're going to get in here and play games with us. In other words, if they're not going to going to go along with with our scheme here to change this corporation around, then don't play at all because we don't need six or eight or ten bunch of patriots in here buying shares and giving their proxies to six or eight different people. If they do that, all we're doing, folks, is masturbating, and it's absolutely non-productive. Maybe a lot of fun. Everybody can say, "Oh, I'm really participating," but it's not going to amount to anything. Ladies and gentlemen, so make sure you understand that either participate and go along with what we intend to do so that we'll have the power of a large block of voting stock owned by citizens of this country who are sick and tired of what the news media has been doing to us and can turn this corporation around and make it work in our best interest or get the hell out of town and don't don't interfere with what we're doing. Please. Okay, folks. Make sure that you're in a chair, you're comfortable, you got your mind open, you've got a pad of paper and a pencil by your side because we're going to spread some light in some dark corners. Visitors to New York City who venture in to the large building known as the United Nations are amazed to find that there is a meditation room. The meditation room, ladies and gentlemen, is 30 feet long. 18 feet wide at the entrance, which faces north-northeast, and 9 feet wide at the other end. It is, therefore, wedge-shaped. Its only entrance is through two tinted glass pane doors outside of which stands a United Nations guard. Inside the room is another guard. Once through the doors, the visitor finds himself in a darkened corridor which leads to the left. The sharp transition from a world of light to one of extreme darkness forces a feeling of abrupt withdrawal from the outside world upon the senses of the visitor who walks along the corridor, reaches the inner arced entrance, turns right, and then looks into the room. The room is very dimly lit. The only source of light at first glance is that which is reflected squarely from the gleaming upper surface of the brooding, somber altar in the center of the room. A special lens recessed in the ceiling focuses a beam of light on the altar from a point above and just beyond its far edge. Thin lines of bluish light lap the edges of the shadow cast by the altar. The acoustical properties of the room are unique. The edges of padding material behind the paneling on the walls can be detected at the ceiling level. This absorbs sound, as does the Swedish woven blue rug which covers the floor of the corridor and the back of the room. The room is as quiet as an underground tomb. Its floor is paved with blue-gray slate slabs laid in a haphazard pattern. At the edge of the rug are two very low railings extending out from the east and west walls of the room. The center space between the railings is some six feet in width. To the right of the inner entrance are ten low wicker benches arranged in two rows of three and one back row of four against the corridor wall. Attempts by visitors to pass the railings are discouraged by the guard. The mural is a fresco which was painted originally on wet plaster one section at a time by the artist with the aid of an expert in this work brought from Europe. It is set into a steel-framed narrow panel projected from the wall, behind which is an enclosed area, some six inches deep, which has its own light source. A small square projector, set close against the front base of the altar, throws a diffused beam of light from a recessed aperture upon the surface of the mural. There are also ten hidden lights, five on each side of the room, behind the upper edges of a thin suspended ceiling which extends out over the room from the top of the mural. The 18-inch space between the two ceilings contains the light control apparatuses. The lower ceiling is wedge-shaped and separated from three walls of the inner room by a foot-wide space. 
Thus, the room appears, appears to be much longer than it really is because of the many converging lines leading into the narrow end, the corners of which are rounded off on either side of the mural. The altar is four feet high and rests on two narrow cross pieces. It is a dark gray block of crystalline iron ore from a Swedish mine and weighs six and one-half tons. The Swedish government presented this block of ore, the largest of its kind ever mined, to the United Nations in early 1957. The chunk rests on a concrete pillar that goes straight down to bedrock. The area and passageway beneath the room are closed to the public. The chunk of ore has been described as a lodestone or magnetite, which is strongly magnetic and which possesses polarity. In northern Sweden are what may be the largest magnetite deposits in the world believed to have been formed by segregation in the magma. Magma is the term for molten material held in solution under the pressure of the Earth's crust. The fresco mural was described in the United Nations Review of January 1958 as having been designed, quote, to conform with the purity of line and color sought for what Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld has called a room of stillness, unquote. It was painted predominantly in shades of grays and blues, but includes yellow and white patterns and a black half sphere. Light, pure colors intersect to form deeper shades. The New York Times described the fresco as being 8 feet 8 inches in height and 6 feet 8 inches in width, more brightly illuminated at the top than at the bottom. Bobesco, an old friend of Dag Hammarskjöld, painted the mural. Quote, Dag had me start sketches on this last summer, unquote, he said. Quote, he wanted me to do the actual work right here in the room, so I have been here since October 6th, 1957, unquote. The mural was seen for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, on November the 11th, 1957. During the period of the remodeling, the guards were on hand during the day to keep out the curious, and at night the room was locked up with a chain and padlock. The artist said of his work, Quote, it has no title, and you can make what you wish of it, unquote. He explained that the geometric patterns in the mural repeated the proportions of the room and those of the focal point of the room, the piece of iron ore. He also said that he intended to give a feeling of space with the picture. The United Nations Review story stated that, quote, he sought to open up the room so that the eye can travel in the distance when it strikes the wall. To give a slight upward movement, he said he designed winding circles in a spiraling diagonal line which might be compared to a vibrating musical chord. As a resting spot for the viewer's eyes, he provided one spot of black amid the light colors, a half-circle at which all lines of the fresco and the room converge. In the New Yorker story cited earlier, Besco was quoted as saying, quote, My fresco contained no intentional symbols, though I've heard people say that the black and pale blue circle in the upper middle section of the panel stands for the cosmos. All that I seriously sought to do was to open up the wall in order to let the eye travel farther, and to open up the mind, provoking meditation, but not directing it, unquote. The mystic P.D. Auspensky has written that in, quote, real art, nothing is accidental. It is mathematics. Everything in it can be calculated. Everything can be known beforehand. The artist knows and understands what he wants to convey, and his work cannot produce one impression on one man and another impression on another, presuming, of course, they are people on one level. At the same time, the same work of art will produce different impressions on people of different levels, and people from lower levels will never receive from it what people of higher levels receive. This is real objective art. An objective work of art affects the emotional, and not only the intellectual side of man, unquote. Mr. Besco's picture is described as non-objective, yet its composition admittedly reflects the dimensions of the room and the chunk of iron ore. This, ladies and gentlemen, involves mathematics. He said of his mural, 
quote, you can make what you wish of it, unquote, yet he admittedly sought to create a specific subjective effect in the mind of the spectator. Consequently, Mr. Besco's remarks create confusion rather than understanding. The leaflet made available to those who visit the meditation room was written under the direction of Dag Hammarskjöld himself. Its description of the room is deliberately couched in abstruse language. It contains terms which have meaning to the esoterically inclined, but not to the uninitiated, are those called the profane. These terms will be explained, and have in fact been explained, during the mystery Babylon segments of the hour of the time, but for those who may be just beginning to listen to this program, esoteric means that which is hidden and is kept only for the initiated, those who have studied the mysteries. The profane, ladies and gentlemen, is you. I leave myself out because during the process of studying the mysteries, I, I, with great irony, have become illumined. And if you continue to listen to the hour of the time, so shall you. The leaflet reads, quote, We all have within us a center of stillness surrounded by silence. People of many faiths will meet here, and for that reason none of the symbols to which we are accustomed in our meditation could be used. However, there are simple things which speak to us all with the same language. We have sought for such things, and we believe that we have found them in the shaft of light striking the shimmering surface of solid rock. So in the middle of the room, we see a symbol of how daily the light of the skies gives light, life to the earth on which we stand, a symbol to many of us of how the light of the Spirit gives life to matter. But the stone in the middle of the room has more to tell us. We may see it as an altar, empty, not because there is no God, not because it is an altar to an unknown God, but because it is dedicated to the God whom man worships under many names and in many forms. The stone in the middle of the room reminds us also of the firm and permanent in a world of movement and change. The block of iron ore has the weight and solidity of the everlasting. It is a reminder of that cornerstone of endurance and faith on which all human endeavor must be based. The material of the stone leads our thoughts to the necessity for choice between destruction and peace. Of iron man has forged his swords, of iron he has also made his plowshares. The shaft of light strikes the stone in a room of utter simplicity. When our eyes travel from these symbols to the front wall, they meet a simple pattern, opening up the room to the harmony, freedom, and balance of space. There is an ancient Chinese saying that the sense of a vessel is not in its shell, but in the void. So it is with this room. It is for those who come here to fill the void with what they find in their center of stillness. Unquote. The World Goodwill Bulletin is published by Lucis Press Limited, owned by Lucis Trust, at 88 Edgware Road, Marble Arc, London, W2, England. The New York branch, the Lucis Publishing Company, 11 West 42nd Street, 32nd Floor, issues materials on its arcane school. Three member triangles in World Service Fund and publishes the Beacon Magazine. This company ladies and gentlemen, was originally established as the Lucifer Publishing Company, but changed its name on November the 11th, 1924, to the less startling one it bears today. A third branch of the Lucis Trust is located at 1 Rue de Verembe 3E, Geneva, Switzerland. Alice A. Bailey, the now deceased High Priestess of the Occult Arcane School, established and headed the trust and its self-identified society of illumined minds. This powerful group has intimate connections with the United Nations. The Goodwill, the World Goodwill Bulletin issued a special edition on the United Nations in July 1957, which contained an article entitled, quote, Lodestone, unquote. We quote from its description of the meditation room. 
Quote, the visitor will be totally unprepared for what he will see as he steps in the door for a moment of quiet. Because of the converging walls and the dim light, he will experience a peculiar spatial disorientation, and dimension and perspective will seem difficult to establish. In the center of the room, he will see illuminated by a single point of light from the ceiling, a rectangular mass. The ore piece is many millions of years old. One feels as though one is in a repository for some natural talisman of significant and noble importance, rather than in a chapel in the ordinary sense. Those who are wedded to seeking communion in traditional settings may be somewhat ill at ease here. This is a sudden break with prior experience. One is thrown violently upon his own resources. The room and the concept do not seem indicative of the supplications or the dualistic concept of the mystic in which illumination is sought as a boon granted by deity, rather seemingly inherent in the decoration of the room, in the pinpoint of light playing on the ore, is the concept of a personal concentration of forces, creating a focus that illumines the field of attention. The pinpoint of light, the void of space, the illuminated crystalline ore, one feels projected into a setting of cosmological symbolism rather than one of planetary or even solar intent. It is interesting to speculate on what the long-term influence of this new departure will be on current religious thinking. Ensconced here in the highest hall of man, it cannot be inconsiderable. Whatever interpretations one may attribute to the United Nations Meditation Room, it can be said with certainty that the words and the repercussions have only just begun, unquote. Folks, the new departure in religion referred to did not occur by chance. Tremendous pressure was brought to bear on Trigivlai and Dag Hammarskjöld to install such a room at the United Nations by such organizations as the World Council of Churches. Trigev Lai announced on April 18, 1949, that such a room would be established. The Fifth General Assembly opened with one minute of silence as a religious observance. Shortly thereafter, a temporary meditation room was provided at Lake Success, New York. On February 9, 1951, a meditation room was opened for one day at the United Nations Secretariat Building. Then on October 14, 1952, the opening day of the 7th General Assembly, a permanent meditation room was made available to the public. Since then, each assembly has opened with one minute of silence. In 1955, the meditation room contained a 300-year-old, 800-pound, 37-inch wide upright section of an agba, or mahogany tree, from French Equatorial Africa. It was the idea of Wallace Harrison, director of the International Board of Architects, which planned the United Nations, co-architect and director of Rockefeller Center, and member of the board of directors of the Socialist New School of Social Research in New York City. See Who's Who in America for 1959 for reference. The room contained a philodendron plant on the altar, to symbolize some unknown person killed in a war, an olive green rug, 25 russet colored chairs, and a blue and white United Nations banner set in front of a ceiling to floor white drape. On February 16, 1953, a group known as the Friends of the Meditation Room, numbering 1,500 members, presented through its officers a set of guest books to the United Nations, wherein visitors to the room could inscribe their names, addresses, and religious affiliations. Since then, many, many millions have been estimated by the United Nations to have entered the room. Of these visitors, of these visitors, millions have signed these books, each containing 7,000 names. What purpose, ladies and gentlemen, is served by the accumulation of these thousands of names of individuals with their religious affiliations who visit the room and who by the act of signing their names indicate that they do not object to the existence of this pagan temple? 
The Friends are a product of the non-sectarian layman's movement for a Christian world incorporated. The international headquarters of which is located at Wainwright House, Milton Point, Rye, New York. Warren R. Austin, a past permanent United States delegate to the United Nations, headed a Friends Committee which presented $12,600 to Dodd Hummershall on April 24, 1957, as first payment on $25,000 needed to remodel and enlarge the room. The movement has issued United Nations Meditation Room identification cards to 300 men and women who go periodically to this room for prayer. It once issued prayer cards to visitors containing prayers from the, quote, world's great living religions, unquote, namely Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islamism, Sikhism, Christianity, and St. Francis of Assisi. I was not aware that St. Francis of Assisi was one of the world's great religions, were you? The Friends held vigils of prayer in the room in 1953 and 1954. Back in 1946, the movement had sent Dr. Frank Laubach, Union Theological Seminary graduate and author of, quote, Letters of a Modern Mystic, unquote, to the Paris Peace Conference to lobby for the establishment of the meditation room. Speakers for the movement's meetings have included Norman Cousins, Ralph Bunch, and Frank P. Graham of the United Nations, and William Ernest Hawking, and Kirtley F. Mather of Harvard, all of whom have communist front records. See the May, June, and July-August 1959 and July-August 1962 issues of the Layman's Movement Review. The movement has included among its members Dwight David Eisenhower, the most important friend of the movement from its inception, however, has been John D. Rockefeller, Jr., a Methodist missionary, Wayman C. Huckabee, secured and received grants from John D. Rockefeller, Jr.'s Davison Fund and from his New York City Riverside Church Funds for five consecutive years, 1937 through 1941, for a health center in Hiroshima, Japan. Huckabee then became the secretary of the movement in New York, in 1941, and secured two grants a year for the organization from the Davison Fund until it was liquidated. It is not coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that the funds John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s Davison Fund and from his New York City Riverside Church Funds for the years 1937 to 1941, were for the health center in Hiroshima, Japan, a city which we ultimately dropped an atomic weapon. Rockefeller, ladies and gentlemen, continued his yearly grants without fail from his own personal funds. During the 22 years Huckabee remained with the movement, a million dollars was raised for its work. When the movement first sought to secure Wainwright House for its headquarters in 1951, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. gave $5,000 of the $25,000 needed. Since 1951, 10,000 individuals have signed the guest book of Wainwright House. 5,000 have attended its public meetings. Its members have been addressed by the president of the National Council of Churches. Its conference rooms have been used by the Episcopal, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Congregationalist, and Quaker churches. When the Friends of the Meditation Room agreed to raise $15,000 to pay for the redecoration of the room, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. gave $5,000 of the amount sought. Dodd Hammarskjöld personally raised another $10,000 from the Marshall Field family for the cost of the fresco in the room. The United Steelworkers, AFL-CIO, gave $500. The movement was formed, ladies and gentlemen, in 1940. The man who started it was Dr. Arthur Compton, the scientist who first brought the identified communist and accused agent espionage Professor J. Robert Oppenheimer into the Atomic Energy Project in 1942. Wainwright House has its own meditation room on its second floor. The room contains the Agba wood altar first used in the UN meditation room and the cherry wood chairs and drapes from that room presented to the friends by the United Nations in 1957. 
The house also contains a large library centered around the Thomas Sugru Memorial Library, a $1,600 collection of books on religion and occultism, where one may read up on spiritualism, Zen, Taoism, Yoga, Judaism, etc. Every book in the library has a book plate therein designed by the artist Fritz Eichenberg. His book plate depicts the ancient cross in the shape of a T surrounded by a serpent symbolizing wisdom and healing and forming the letter S. The T and S, Thomas the Gru's initials, are crowned by the lotus. Vendantic representation of all being. In the background lies the city of Jerusalem, over which shine two stars, the star of the east of Christianity and six-pointed star of Judaism. A flame spreads an arc of light above, proclaiming the continuity of life and the immortality of the soul. M. Oldfield Howey tells us in the Encircled Serpent that in the symbolism of Egypt, the serpent is constantly represented as surmounting a cross. The brazen serpent was a palladium or talisman in the form of a serpent coiled around the mystic tau or T. The serpent set up by Moses was originally the Egyptian sun god who is now known to his people as Jehovah. Unquote. Joseph von Hammer in the History of the Assassins explains the Tao as the figure of the Phallus. Quote, Among the Egyptians, the lotus was the symbol of Osiris and Isis. It was esteemed a sacred ornament by the priests. The six-pointed star is the great oriental talisman known as the seal of Solomon. Its meaning, its meaning, ladies and gentlemen, and the identity of Osiris and Isis has already been explained in past episodes of the Hour of the Time. It will also be explained on a later edition of the Hour of the Time when we discuss the great seal of the United States of America. The arc of light on the book plate is the insof from the Kabbalistic writings, or mystical theosophy, which teach that it created the world by virtue of ten emanations from the Infinite One. The emanations are sephiroth, or arranged into a form called the Tree of Life, which in turn is vertically composed of three pillars. C.W. King, in his Gnostics, states that the two outer pillars figure largely amongst all the secret societies of modern times. And naturally so, for these Illuminati have borrowed without understanding it the phraseology of the Kabbalists. Dag Hammarskjöld called the altar a reminder of that, quote, cornerstone on which all human endeavor must be based, unquote. The meditation room faces north-northeast. To enter the room, one must proceed from darkness to light. From darkness to light. With these facts in mind, note the Kabbalistic symbolism of the following description of the cornerstone by an authority. Quote, in its situation, it lies between the north, the place of darkness, and the east, the place of light. And hence this position symbolizes progress from darkness to light and from ignorance to knowledge. The permanence and durability of the cornerstone is intended to remind us that long after our death we have within ourselves a sure foundation of eternal life, a cornerstone of immortality and emanation which pervades all nature and which therefore must, must survive the tomb Unquote. On a higher level of esoteric knowledge, the metal altar or stone can be likened to the ancient stone of foundation, which according to the same authority cited above was supposed, quote, to have been placed at one time within the foundations of the Temple of Solomon and afterwards, during the building of the second temple, transported to the Holy of Holies. It was in the form of a perfect cube, or as the Freemasons call it, ashlar and had inscribed upon its upper face within a delta or triangle the sacred tetragrammaton or ineffable name of God. In a scurrilous book of the Middle Ages, The Life of Jesus, there was another account of the stone. 
quote, At that time there was in the temple the ineffable name of God inscribed upon the stone of foundation, unquote. The scandalous book proceeded to state that our Savior, quote, cunningly obtained a knowledge of the tetragrammaton from the stone of foundation and by its mystical influence was enabled to perform his miracles. There was a very general prevalence among the earliest nations of antiquity of the worship of stones as the representative of deity, and in England the queen sits upon a throne under which is a stone. This happens in almost every ancient temple, and in every ancient temple there was a legend of a sacred or mystical stone. The mystical stone there has received the name of the, quote, stone of foundation, unquote. And the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, quote, He has Beelzebub, and by the prince of devils he casts out devils, unquote. Alfred Edward Waite, in his study of the Zohar, the Kabbalistic textbook of the 14th century, entitled The Secret Doctrine of Israel, wrote on page 62 of a, quote, mysterious stone called Shathia, unquote, which was cast by Jehovah into the abyss so to form the basis of the world and give birth thereto. One might say otherwise that it was like a cubical stone or altar, for its extremity was concealed in the depth, while its surface or summit rose above the chaos. It was the central point in the immensity of the world, the cornerstone, the tried stone, the sure foundation, but also that stone which the builders rejected. Unquote. And where have we heard that before? Well, folks, nowhere else but in the teachings of Freemasonry. But what really, in the Christian meaning, is the cornerstone? Isaiah said, quote, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lay a stone in the foundations of Sion, a tried stone, a cornerstone, a precious stone, founded in the foundation. He that believeth, let him not hasten, unquote. The cornerstone is Jesus Christ, quote, the stone which the builders rejected, unquote. One need go no further than the inner entrance of the meditation room to see concrete evidence of the godlessness of the United Nations. That word sticks in my throat, godlessness. The stone, the metal altar, in its stark setting in that room is in itself a symbol of idolatry. Quote, stone worship was perhaps the earliest form of fetishism. Eusebius cites Porphyry as saying that the ancients represented the deity by a black stone because his nature is obscure and inscrutable. The reader here will be reminded of the black stone, Hajar el Aswad, placed in the southwest corner of the Kaaba at Mecca, which is worshipped by the ancient Arabians. The Druids, it is well known, had no other images of their gods but cubical or sometimes columnar stones. To use the language of Dudley, the pillar or stone was adapted as a symbol of strength and firmness, a symbol also of the divine power, and by ready inference a symbol or idol of the deity himself, the god Hermes or Mercury, was represented without hands or feet, being a cubical stone, because the cubical figure betokened his solidity and stability, unquote. Hammerschold, in the speech quoted earlier, said, quote, In this case, we wanted this massive altar to give the impression of something more than temporary. We had another idea. We thought we could bless by our thoughts the very material out of which arms are made. The description of the author as a natural talisman by the World Goodwill Group also is significant. Talisman is a term which means a stone or other object engraven with figures or characters to which is attributed the occult powers of the planetary influences and celestial configurations under which it was made. Altars among the ancients were generally made of turf or stone, usually in a cubical form. Altars were erected long before temples. The shaft of light upon the altar in the meditation room casts a shadow to the north. 
the use of the north as a symbol of darkness, a portion of the old sun worship, of which we find so many relics in Gnosticism, in Hermetic philosophy, in Freemasonry, in the temples of all of the secret societies, which exist in a membership in the shape of a pyramid, with a whole bunch of slathering idiots thirsting after the secrets, which they will never know, and a few at the top, who really understand that the only secret is how to control those on the bottom. The East was the place of the sun's daily birth, and hence highly revered. The North, the place of his annual death. Finally, it must be emphasized, above all, that the altar in the meditation room is unsanctified and unhallowed. It has no sacred meaning, can inspire no reverence, and is not inviolable. This altar cannot be used for sacrifice in any other than an unholy sense. Ladies and gentlemen, one clue to the mural's symbolism is given in Hammerschall's and Beskow's description of its purpose. It was to open up the wall, to give a feeling of space, of the void, in effect to extend the room further out into another dimension, as it were. The Friends leaflet, a call to prayer, states the theme of the mural is, quote, infinity, unquote. Now let us look at this mural squarely from the viewpoint of the esoterically inclined the occultist, the adept, the initiate. There is an asymmetrical arrangement of the entire mural into what is called a magic square, which is a square arranged in an equal number of cells, in this case nine, three rows up and three rows down. The game tic-tac-toe is based on this type of square. The talismanic magic square has a series of numbers in the cells. The enumeration of all of whose columns, vertically, horizontally, and diagonally, will give the same sum. The following nine digits, so arranged as to add up to 15 in any direction, were regarded as sacred because 15 is the numerical value of the Hebrew word for God, Yah, spelled J-A-H, which is one of the forms of the tetragrammaton. And in the rows, going across from left to right in each row, the first row, the numbers are 4, 9, and 2. In the second row, the numbers are 3, 5, and 7. And in the third row, the numbers are 8, 1, and 6. Whether you add them up diagonally, vertically, or horizontally, no matter in which direction you go, it always adds up to the number 15. The predominantly dark blue rectangle, which occupies most of the middle tier of the mural, the upper side of which passes through the exact middle of the small bisected sphere, represents the altar. The yellow rectangle, set at an angle into the lower and middle tiers so that one corner touches the bottom of the mural, is a second representation of the altar. They indicate, ladies and gentlemen, duality. Remember the yin and the yang, positive, negative, male, female, the androgynous god, the yellow figure, light, the sun, the blue figure, earth, the altar. Both rectangular figures are overlaid in part by other patterns in other colors. The all-important sphere in the left upper middle section symbolizes, among other things, the sun. Sun worship was the oldest and by far the most prevalent of all the ancient religions. The sphere is bisected and quartered, the phenomena of nature that made the deepest religious impression on archaic man were the outstretched heavens above him and the outspread earth beneath, both of which he naturally divided into four quarters. This fourfold heaven and earth he signified by a circle, or a square divided crossways. The circle... Ladies and gentlemen, is met within every form of sorcery. The circle in quadrants is called the magic circle. The objects in the meditation room are intended to be evocative in the religious sense. Of what? Well, the mural and altar are admittedly symbols. By symbolism, the simplest, the commonest objects are transformed or idealized and acquire a new, and so to say, an illimitable value. An expert on these subjects has written, quote, Under occult dominion art, music and politics all tend to the same end. Confusion. A calculated and inducted confusion. Chaos for minds that are confused will obey and bow to the hidden masters and out of chaos. Out of chaos comes order. And isn't that 
Isn't that the motto of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry? Ordo, ab, teo. Quote, the rule of the triangle and the ellipse together with a crude geometry in modern art is the rule in aesthetics. Standing before a meaningless cubist canvas at an art exhibition, one day a puzzled amateur asked, quote, but what does it mean? Unquote, to which the painter replied, it's not a question of what it means, it's a question of what is its effect on the observer. Consciously or unconsciously, the artist spoke the truth. Psychiatrists tell us that this school of insidious humbug is simply an elaboration of the policy of the interruption of ideas leading to total incoherence and madness. Cubist art is an effort to produce certain psychic effects obtainable by optical illusion. Beauty has nothing, nothing to do with it. The Cubist school is not the realm of art at all. It belongs to that of medicine and psychic science. Those who forget that this devastating fad of the interrupted idea can be extended to music, literature, and every other phase of human effort do so at their own pearl. For instance, listen closely to the beat of the rap musician. Quote, a mind that is positive cannot be controlled for the purpose of occult dominion minds must therefore be rendered passive and negative in order that control can be conceived. Minds consciously working to a definite end are a power, and power can oppose power for good or for evil. The scheme for world dominion might be doomed by the recognition of this principle alone, but as it is unfortunately unrecognized, it remains unchallenged, unquote, until we decided to purchase a media corporation, and thus now, now, we have minds consciously working to a definite end, and we are now a power, a very great power. A striking feature of the mural is the white half crescent in its upper right quadrant, the inner curve of the crescent closest to the bisected black, pale blue, and yellow sphere is equidistant at all points from the exact center of the bisected figure. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if the curve of the crescent is continued full circle, the figure which results is a hidden point within a circle, the symbol which was adopted by the astronomers as their sign of the sun, and of course you know that the crescent is the sign of the moon, Isis and Osiris. In the ancient mysteries, the point in the circle denoted the principle of fecundity and has been carried down through the ages as a sign of various secret societies, including the Illuminati of Adam Weishaupt in 1776, and you will find the dot in the circle in the temples of Freemasonry. It is the symbol of the phallus. We always come back to the generative force. The female principle is also emphasized in the crescent moon or lunette figure of Isis. There are 72 geometrical figures and shadings in the mural, the two crescent shapes and the four long triangles, white, yellow, blue, and black, which are located in the two upper tiers of the mural, are each counted as one figure. The number 72 denoted from the earliest days the divine name of 72 words, 72 words. This number is derived from a permutation of the values assigned to the four letters of the Tetragrammaton, or J-H-V-H, -H, Yehovah, the ineffable, unpronounceable name of God. This name and its multitude of forms can be used to work miracles or magic, so say the Kabbalists. It was derived from Exodus. Chapter 14, verses 19, 20, and 21, which each consist of 72 letters. Now, if these three verses be written at length, one above another, the first from right to left, the second from left to right, and the third from right to left, or as the Greeks would say, bustrophidon, they will give 72 columns of three letters each. Then each column will be a word of three letters and as there are 72 columns, there will be 72 words of three letters, each of which will be the 72 names of the deity alluded to in the text. And these are called the Shem Ham Faresh. 72 is also the number 
of the quinaries are sets of 5 degrees and the 360 degrees of the zodiac. The number of triangles in the mural are difficult to count. There are 22 isosceles, equilateral, scalene, right angles, triangles. There are also 22 numbered letters in the ancient Hebrew alphabet with values of 1 to 400. The triangle is an ancient emblem of the deity. It is also a sign of the female element. However, if the apex of the triangle is pointed down, it becomes the male element. Thus inverted, it may also represent Lucifer, particularly if it is black in color. The sphere figure, or the spiral figure, intertwined with a mural length diagonal line, symbolizes the Caducus of Hermes, or Mercury, which mythologically is represented as two serpents twined around the winged one of Mercury. Nine arcs are formed by the intersections of the spiral line with the diagonal. The ninth Hebrew letter, Teth, with the value of nine, has the signification of serpent. The number of the beast of Revelation is 666, which cabalistically is nine, the number of generation. The twin serpents of the Caducus are negative and positive, representing polarity, and twine around the spinal column. They are the Kundalini, or sex force. In the encircled serpent, the chapter on the Caducus contains references on page 72 to the ancient use of the symbol without wings as seen in the mural. The Caducus is also the symbol of peace, the propaganda term associated with the United Nations. The serpents are male and female, the sun god and the moon god, and are symbols of generation, or the phalas. Buddha was symbolized by the serpent, and in mythology is identical with Mercury. The center sphere and the outer circles around it form the all-seeing eye. This bisected sphere overlays an isosceles triangle bounded on one side by the diagonal line. According to Manley Palmer Hall in his occult treatise on the secret destiny of America, the all-seeing eye is that of the great architect of the universe whenever it appears as a symbol of God. His explanation is that which is generally accepted. It is, however, erroneous, a full commentary on the meaning of this all-important symbol has already been dealt with in previous episodes of the Hour of the Time. The mural, if viewed from the top or the roof overhead of the meditation room, is is the truncated top of a pyramid. Behind the mural is a small, smaller pyramid, which is that which contains the eye, the all-seeing eye of Lucifer. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Good evening, folks. Tonight's episode is a rerun. Due to the great mass of bullshit poured out on Radio Freemasonry just prior to this program, we will expose this wolf in sheep's clothing in his own words. Tonight we're going to play a portion of a program that originally aired on June the 23rd, 1993. If after hearing tonight's program you wish to order... That original broadcast, it is tape number 123 in our catalog. That's tape number 123 in our catalog. We discussed this rerun a little bit last night, so you all know the subject. But you all need to hear it again, even those of you who heard it the first time that it was broadcast, and those of you, of course, who have never heard it and are struggling, attempting to understand the purpose of of the hour of the time. We hope that this rebroadcast will bring some things into the forefront that have been lurking into the shadows and will make some of the conversation that you've heard on the hour of the time much clearer. We encourage you to order the original tape from the original broadcast on June 23, 1993 so that you may study its content in your Home. Now, without further ado, we go in to the rebroadcast of the Mystery Exposé. At the end of this rerun, ladies and gentlemen, we will open the phones for your comments 
and questions. Now, folks, I'm going to take you into the mind of someone who has been an initiate, an adept, a priest of the Mystery School for many, many years. I'm not going to identify this person until the end of the program. I want you to see if you can guess who this person is and what this is all about. If you can, then you'll know instantly what this program is for, the reason behind it, and you'll be able to understand a little bit better how you've been manipulated for many, many years by the priest of the hidden religion called Mystery Babylon. And if you can't guess, then at the end of the show, you're going to be told, and you better be holding on to your chair, because it just might knock you right out. Just might knock you right out. I'm going to quote from a book that this person wrote. This person uh, verified something that I wrote in my book, Behold a Pale Horse, and that is the calendar of the hidden religion of mystery Babylon. It's 6,000 years, and it started in 4,000 B.C. and ends in the year 2000. Quote, The Great Pyramid System of Passages and Chambers is a chronological graph that begins in 4,000 B.C. and continues for 6,000 years. Unquote. Now, let's go to an interview that was conducted with this person by someone else, not by me. But I'm going to be reading to you, word for word, this entire interview. And this is going to take up most of the program. But this is going to give you a glimpse into the personality, the religious beliefs of the priests of the mystery religion. And you'll see sort of how they try to disguise what they really believe behind this aura of wanting to further the evolution of mankind and create some kind of a world utopia which they know in their heart is a lie to begin with. So, I'm going to call these number one and number two. Number one is the interviewer. Number two is the interviewee. Number one, how did you become interested in the Great Pyramid? Number two, well, like everyone else, for most of my life, I accepted the idea that the Great Pyramid was just a great big pile of stone made by thousands and thousands of slaves. But I read a book in 1967 called The Ultimate Frontier. That book profoundly affected my life. In it, they made statements about the Great Pyramid being much more than a tomb, when in fact it never was a tomb for a pharaoh. It is a monument to mankind and human perfection. It is the oldest artifact of an ancient system of religious belief. Then I thought, that's something I can check out. I can see if the information in the ultimate frontier is true or not. I started investigating. I then learned a great number of things about the Great Pyramid. First of all, the ancient Greeks were quite right in calling it the first wonder of the world. When one considers the thought, preparation, and choice of sight, one will see that the solid bedrock of the Giza Plateau, the only tableland within miles capable of supporting the weight of the structure, was the most intelligent choice. There is a fantastic amount of literature about the Great Pyramid. Therefore, it is not unusual that we also find a great deal of controversy surrounding it. The British in the 1860s were the first to study the ancient building in a serious manner by re-examining the theories of the British, which were discarded by the experts of that time, the crux of my book began to take shape. Number one, does the crux of your book include the fact that the Great Pyramid may not have been built by the ancient Egyptians? Number two, yes. The British did not discuss that possibility. That possibility is my own bit of research. However, most people who study the Great Pyramid realize that the civilization we know as ancient Egyptian could not have built the Great Pyramid the way we know today it would have had to have been built. You see, the building is built geometrically perfect, and according to our present conception of ancient history, the Egyptians didn't understand highly theoretical mathematics, obviously from the way the other 89 major pyramids in Egypt were constructed. The manner in which the other pyramids were constructed was a very haphazard way of building. They are copies of the Great Pyramid. 
The Great Pyramid itself is, however, absolute perfection in stone, both to the pi relationship, the relationship of a diameter to the circumference of a circle, and the golden mean are five relationship with which we can divide a straight line so that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The reason why it was structured is embodied in the word itself, pyramid, which means lights and measures, that there are revelation types of lights. The word for pyramid used by the ancient Egyptians was glorious light. And the word has meaning that there are revelations in the measurements. If you pursue this hint, so to speak, you find out that the builders of the Great Pyramid are the same people that wrote the original text of the Old Testament, and they laid out their plan in the Great Pyramid as well as in the Scriptures. I hope, folks, you understand the significance of that one statement, and there's much, much more to come. Number one, who are these people? Number two, my opinion is they were what we call hexos or hexos, and we find traces of them throughout Mesoamerica, India, and the Middle East in the earliest of times. The Egyptians had two or three different ways of hexos rulers come in. The word hexos for many years was translated shepherd kings, which is a paradox. You see, looking at life the way we look at it today, how could a group who were non-warlike come into a land and take over and run things without any fighting? Yet they obviously did, and these ancient builders had a profound influence wherever they went. The years of research I've done tell me that the Hyksos were a group of people who had in their culture information stemming from a previous civilization. I think that our view of history, saying that it started in the cradle of civilization, in Egypt, and Mesopotamia is wrong. The surviving evidence indicates both Egypt and Mesopotamia are actually later civilizations, remnants of a far, far greater early empire. And here, folks, we see in this person's philosophy the same philosophy that Hitler pursued, the myth of ancient Atlantis or Mu, if you will, an ancient civilization, which, when it was destroyed, left behind a remnant, a surviving element of that race, which is a super race, more intelligent, smarter, more worthy than any other race on this earth, if you will, the master race. If you understand the esoteric meaning of what you're hearing, you are hearing... Nazi philosophy, National Socialism, Hitler's vision of world history. And when you find out who this person is and what he's doing now, we'll all come together. We continue. Number one, do you think the Hexos race was a race chosen by some greater intelligence to impart a superior ideology to the rest of the human race? Number two, not so much chose, but actually chose themselves. All genius is self-appointed. I would say these people were a remnant from a previous culture, and they had something they wanted to do, and they embodied their thinking in their work, and they influenced people by their works. Folks, that's the Luciferian philosophy. Continue. They came into the land, and there were already humans in the Nile Valley. But they came into the land in an unobtrusive and dexterous maneuver so as not to alarm the existing culture. They came in without fighting. They took the worst land. They didn't try to impress their knowledge on the others. They just did things in a better way. Soon the people in that area were paying attention to them. Once they gained the attention of the people, it didn't take very long before they were running everything because they did everything with better methodology, which is the way life ought to be. You ought to show by example. Number one, what happened then? Number two, fairly soon after arriving, they suggested to the people that as life was now so peaceful and harmonious, it would be a happy challenge to build a monument to the future, to the future of mankind. In my opinion, the Hyksos philosophy and the philosophy of many modern people is identical in that human beings 
can be perfect if they work toward that end and that is the heart and soul philosophy of Mystery Babylon, the mystery school, that man himself will become God. Wait until you find out who this is. Number one, what happened to the ancient tribe, the Hyksos? Number two, I think they are still in existence today and have not died out, but have gone underground many thousands of years ago. What we call masonry, Freemasonry is an offshoot of the group that started out. The Hyksos group became what the ultimate frontier calls the Brotherhoods. These are a group of people who have knowledge about what it really means to be human. And folks, that implies that the rest of us are not, and that also is in direct line and in direct concert with the philosophy of the mystery religion of Babylon. You see, to them, we are all cattle, animals. We have no intelligence. Continuing, these are a group of people who have knowledge about what it really means to be human, to be a human becoming, to grow toward human perfection. It's a philosophical thing. These people still exist. They still band together in groups here and there. And they show by doing. Again, their lifestyle shows that they really have a handle on what life is all about. They don't try to impress others with numbers or with what they know. They just live doing something they want to accomplish while they are here. We know in Egypt these people formed secret societies and that Pharaoh Akhenaten came up, quote, under the rose, unquote, out of one of these secret societies and took over the land of Egypt in a manner that forbids disclosure at a time in which the superficial popular theology left a want unsatisfied, which religion in a wider sense alone could supply. And there he has admitted that he knows, he knows the esoteric teachings of the mystery schools their origin, and their purpose. And, if you've been listening from the beginning, now you know that this person is a priest of the mystery religion himself. Continuing, we know Alexander the Great wanted to get the knowledge of one of these ancient secret societies because he writes about it a great deal. Pythagoras consented to be circumcised in order to become one of the initiates of these secret societies, which are the Hyksos population carrying their knowledge of science and the universe and cosmology with them and keeping the truth secret so they wouldn't be persecuted and wiped out. You can imagine what society today would do to a group of people like this were they to perform certain ancient rituals in public. Look what they did to Akhenaten as soon as he was dead. They destroyed the city he built. Number one, that's right, they tried to. Number two, wipe out his name. Number one, yes, because he taught there was only one God. Number two, the human tendency in the mass populace. Number one, when you use the term mass populace, are you referring to a group of people who have become undeveloped on account of a too pleasant or a too severe climate or even from physiological or psychological causes? Number two, the phrase mass populace was a term used by the ancient ones, which usually refers to those in a populace, any populace, in any country, who sit back waiting for some savior to raise them up out of their misery. Recognize the venom directed at Christianity, folks? Number one, then you are referring to people who are merely living a conditioned response to their environment. Number two, yes, the human tendency in the mass populace is to tear things down rather than to reach up to the excellent, which brings everything down to mediocrity. We're doing that in this country today with our so-called standards from the federal government. Everything's got to be brought down. This is just another social indication of this tendency in human beings to bring things down to a lower level so it's easier instead of striving for excellence. The Hyksos people went after pleasing results and worked hard in this manner. They strove for excellence, and therefore they had to go underground to keep from being persecuted. In almost every case that we can trace, anyone that tried to bring the truth to man has been crucified or killed in some cruel or barbarous human ritual. And folks, for many years, that was exactly true. 
But this is not the true intent of these people. For if you also go back through history, you'll find that these are the people who have been behind every religious war, have been behind every revolution, have been behind and have literally are the heart and soul of socialism and communism. And everywhere they go, death follows and a stench. Number one, do you know how the Great Pyramid was constructed? Number two, I leave that puzzle to the engineers, architects, and professors of physics who have researched and studied the building. No one at the present really knows. There are several suppositions, but since no one really knows, that mystery remains to be answered in the next 24 years. And since no one really knows, in my opinion, there's no such thing as an expert. Number one, in that case, how do you believe the Great Pyramid may have been constructed? Number two, my information from people who seem very knowledgeable says that they built in with water locks and floated the blocks into place. That's pretty hard to conceive of because they would have had to have been tremendous locks because the Great Pyramid is up on a plateau at least six miles from the banks of the Nile River. Water with a series of basins and pipes that match the corridor and the chamber system of the Great Pyramid's interior system embodies all the laws of hydraulic engineering. For example, the Great Pyramid's Grand Gallery is a perfect vacuum bottle. And this pumping system, which I explain in my book as I explore the research work of Edward J. Kunkel, author of the book Pharaoh's Pump. Well, folks, it's time to take our break. Don't go away. We'll be right back and continue with this revelation after this very short pause. And we continue, folks. Number one. If this tribe of people, the Hyksos, caused the Great Pyramid to be constructed, did they know their message wouldn't be understood for thousands of years, or did they think that humans would grasp its meaning a little bit before that? Number two, I think it's quite apparent that they knew it would be grasped in the 20th century. I think that they laid it out so the core of their meaning would be picked up by those who really had the mathematical know-how. It wasn't until, until 1905 that we had the real understanding of gravitational astronomy, the astronomy involving the solar system and the movement of the Earth around the sun, down so pat that we had all the answers the builders of the Great Pyramid had. They knew as much or more about today's system of gravitational astronomy as we know. Number one, do you think this falls in line with a number of other theories that humans were at one time visited by supremely intelligent beings from other worlds? Number two, I don't accept that thesis. However, I believe that there is life probably on every little planetoid in the entire universe. Life that is similar to ours, having a spiritual nature, but somewhat different in physical nature. No other beings from outer space ever came down here and cohabited with the apes, as Mr. Von Daniken would say. I would reject that thesis, but on the other hand, I would say we are indeed created by another intelligence far greater than this planet or even this solar system. You know, it's a funny thing. I was once an atheist. I went through most of my college days as an atheist. I went through most of my college days as an anthropologist and didn't believe in a creative theory at all. But after studying for many years, I was forced to accept the fact that I obviously had been created because it just didn't happen by chance. There's no way, I would say, that this theory that something in outer space came down and interfered is quite accurate in that respect. We are in the image of a creator of some kind that we can't even conceive. Therefore, we have the ability to do all kinds of fantastic things. I think there was a civilization 50,000 years ago in the Pacific, now underwater, that had in it achievements that we only think of today. Number one. Okay, just a minute. Let me backtrack here. At the beginning of the interview, you mentioned that you began your investigation of the Great Pyramid after you read The Ultimate Frontier. What's it all about? Number two. Oh, that's a big topic. The Ultimate Frontier ties together a history of this planet, the idea and purpose for mankind being a part of it, and a philosophy of growth towards human perfection, and how this philosophy is what life is really all about. The truth of this was lost when the great civilization on the Pacific continent of Mu was destroyed by a sudden cataclysmic change on the crust of the earth 50,000 years ago. There are a group of individuals who call themselves the Brotherhoods. 
unobtrusively working to uplift mankind back to this ancient wisdom belief, and the Great Pyramid is indeed a monument to this particular brotherhood. Number one, perhaps the truth is never lost. Perhaps as we evolve towards a true understanding of essentials, we suddenly find ourselves faced with a question where we discover that we have really understood nothing at all, and consequently have to begin learning all over again on a new and higher level. Perhaps the memory of the destruction of Mu and other catastrophic events is contained in the collective unconsciousness of man. Perhaps some humans, direct genetic descendants of the survivors of these cataclysmic events, carry in their bloodline a genetic mutation. Let me read that portion again, folks. Perhaps some humans, direct genetic descendants of the survivors of these cataclysmic events, carry in their bloodline a genetic mutation. Perhaps this genetic mutation was deeply imprinted into the central nervous system of some of our forebears who actually experienced and survived a sudden slippage in the Earth's tectonic plates or a supernova explosion. Such a genetic mutation passed in genetic structures or DNA from generation to generation may explain why some of us today are more acutely sensitive to subtle earth tremors than our neighbors. In any case, this book, The Ultimate Frontier, started your mental processes working along these lines. Number two. Ah, they were already working along this line, just like many peoples are without knowing about it. I had started into investigation of phenomena and mysticism on my own because my religious convictions couldn't answer my questions. Going to different churches and checking them out, I found it didn't answer my questions as to why I am. I've always wanted to know why. The human physiology is a remarkable thing. Why should it be? Why should we be different than the animals? Why should we have these philosophies when no other animals has philosophy? I studied many of the standard religions, but they couldn't answer my question to my satisfaction. I didn't like the idea of blind faith. I didn't like the idea of blind faith. To me, blind faith is irresponsible and unreasonable. Then I got into science and became an atheist. I was working on a master's degree in anthropology and found that, just like the churches, the information from the scientific side fell short. They can't answer all the questions. In fact, the more we learn, the more anomalies we have, and we realize how little we know. Then my son, who at the time was four and a half years old, nearly drowned. In fact, he did drown. He was full of salt water and unconscious for 45 minutes. He should by all rights have died. The year was 1960. I was eating at a restaurant on the beach when I saw him floating face down in the water. I ran across the beach, jumped into the water, handed him to my brother, who handed him to a strange old man who appeared to be a derelict. When this old man pumped out the water, I was in shock. One of my son for the next 45 minutes. He refused to give my son to the ambulance crew and the doctor who arrived and pronounced him dead. The old man looked into my eyes and said, This boy isn't dead. I'm going to bring him back. I told the doctor, let him keep trying, and the old man kept working. Forty-five minutes is a long period of time to remain unconscious without breathing. However, my son not only recovered without brain damage from that episode, but he told us in the hospital exactly all of the events that took place, from me running out of that restaurant, jumping across the breakwater, diving into the water, and getting him, handing him up to my brother. He recalled all of this as if he had been watching it as a spectator, and yet he was unconscious. I mean, he wasn't Gene Dixon or anything. That personal experience was positive proof in my mind that the human mind is a lot greater than that body. Number one, did it reinforce a previous belief, or did it really serve to allow you to see for the first time that there are other realities? Number two, it made me relook at some of my own experiences. It made me stop and think about a lot of things. For instance, the first thing it made me think of is when I was studying anthropology. I was studying the theory of evolution, chance evolution, chemistry, just providing a scenario for itself to keep procreating and surviving and improving and so on. If we accept evolution as the ultimate answer, we have to accept a ludicrous notion that atoms, all matter, is made up of the atomic elements, can so arrange themselves as to be able to give themselves abstract qualities such as memory, desire, will, curiosity, consciousness, conscience, creativity, intuition, emotion, and reason. How can you get that chemically? You can't. 
It has to be something else that is endowed, and man is the only one that has it. A goat doesn't see the stars or know what's over the mountain or know anything about life and death. You see, but we do. These ideas were in my head, and intuitively I knew there was much more. But when that happened to my son, I realized that I, too, am a discreet bundle of mental energy. Only I didn't have that phraseology for it. I didn't know about what life was all about as I feel I do now. Number one, were you able to determine the capability of the human being to deal with all these diverse areas of knowledge? Number two, certainly I'm doing it and I'm nothing extraordinary. I am dealing with all of these areas of knowledge in a relaxed and causal and fun way. And I feel that I am growing. I am not impatient about my growth because I know that someday, if I continue to try to improve myself, if I continue to use those qualities of mind that I have, then I will become as perfect as humanely possible. Now, according to our basic beliefs in this country, human beings are created in the image of their creator. To me, that means we have the same qualities of mind. We're certainly not the physical image, but the mental image. We have will, memory, desire, curiosity, consciousness, creativity, conscience. I've gone through those before. Intuition, emotion, reason, those ten qualities of mind are the same qualities as the Creator has. Perhaps we can never become absolute perfection as the Creator. Whatever it is, must have been. I cannot conceive of the creative force, not enough to verbalize it and make sense to everyone, but I think we can obtain relative perfection and become one with the Creator by improving ourselves based upon what we have to work with. There's no limit to human abilities, to what humans can do. We limit ourselves by our own conditioning. Number one, do you think that most people are really trying to find out about all these things? Number two, many humans are. I would say there are millions of people who have an inner urging towards something better, especially in this day and age, because now there are more of them here. Out of the great majority, roughly 220 million people today in the United States, only about 2 or 3 million are really interested in what makes them tick. What is involved in life, the purpose of it all, and in really growing and building on their character? The other 200 and something million are merely living a conditioned response from their environment, and they don't think about it at all. Look, here we are in the city of Atlanta, a huge city. Look at the people walking back and forth. They're positive in many ways, and yet they never really give it a thought as to why they are. Why they're capable of building these tremendous buildings and driving those tremendous vehicles they drive. Catholicism has been losing quite a few members because those members say that their religion is not in tune with the times, and this is the case in many other religious bodies. Do you believe that formal religion is just not keeping in tune with the times, or has it ever been in tune with them? Number two. Oh, considerably in tune. Essentially, it's this. The church for the last 2,000 years has done a remarkable job with what it's had to work with. Remember, they're dealing with part of the truth. Part of the truth. I've just finished this week a new book called The Life and Death of Planet Earth. Now, what it points out is that the absolute truth is what we're all trying to find out, and we prove this subjectively. We know it, and nobody can change our minds. Because we know it just like I know that fire burns my fingers because I've stuck them in there. You can tell me all you want, but I won't believe it until I do it. Knowledge is what we're seeking. The church has started off with a paradigm, a framework of understanding, and they had to work within that framework, and their framework was quite narrow. Then Jesus came along and broadened it tremendously. He resurrected the ideas of love and brotherhood and working, you too can do as I do. He was showing by his lifestyle that you can be perfect. You can know yourself. You can know your creator. You can know what it's all about. All you have to do is get off the dime and stop being so lazy and pay attention. That's what he was saying. Human beings have a tendency to want to put frameworks around things so they can be comfortable with them. So the early church put a framework around the truth. Theologians have translated and interpreted what has been said by all the great teachers until it's been quite distorted. However, even with all of the translations and misinterpretations of what was really said in the ancient times, they've done a remarkable job. They've done some bad things as well as good things in the eye of history. But the information is here. All you have to do is want it and dig for it.
I found it. I found it for myself. There's more than one path. The reason I followed the path of the Great Pyramid is because I'm a doubter, a skeptic, and there's something made of stone, the world's largest stone structure. It can be checked and rechecked and measured and remeasured. It's been around for a very, very long time, and there's no doubt it's there. However, the metaphysical idea, somebody going into a trance and some voice talking through him telling me he's Jesus, that doesn't prove anything to me. It could be, but I could never prove it. I can prove what the Great Pyramid does, and that turned me on. There are answers to everyone's questions. We each have progressed, you see. I accept we've lived many thousands of lifetimes. Let me repeat that. I accept we've lived many thousands of lifetimes. People say, oh, reincarnation, I can't believe that. Well, they probably didn't believe it in their last lifetime either. I probably didn't either. However, each time we live a life, we learn something more towards this perfection. This perfection. We're supposed to be growing until finally we reach a point where we choose our incarnation with such great care that we incarnate to two very sharp parents, at which point we grow with a tremendous rate of speed. That's the purpose of it all. Civilization's purpose is to provide the playground, the background, the environment that enhances soul growth, character growth, an environment which enhances the ability of humans to practice the virtues. By practicing these virtues, love, brotherhood, and working, you too can do as I do, which are part of universal law. What you put out comes back to you, karma. You set an example for others by practicing patience, tolerance, forbearance, kindness, and charity. In your everyday life, you grow. By your example, you set off a multitude of self-sustaining series of events, a chain reaction which strengthens the truth. I found this for myself. This is the message in all of the esoteric teachings in all seven of the great religions. I think the key, the key thing that the present human civilization is missing, is that the idea has been lost that we're all responsible. Individual responsibility has been lost. We want some wizard to come along and do it for us. We want the preacher on Sunday to save us from our sins. We want the man in the confessional booth to cleanse us. We don't want to do it for ourselves. Well, there are no wizards. Every single ego, every single created individual or discrete bundle of mental energy must do it for himself. This is part of the message of the Great Pyramid, and as soon as humans realize this and take responsibility for their actions, the problems of the planet Earth will be diminished a thousandfold. Number one, I found it most fascinating, the fact you mentioned a moment ago that the individual ego has a hand in the choice of his or her own incarnated person. Number two, this is esoteric information. I use the term esoteric information. Esoteric meaning inside, inside information. And it's only information that has been given to me. I have not proven it yet. Even if I did prove it, it would still be only information to you. So the difference between information and knowledge is clear. We need to make that clear. Now, my information is that each of us chooses our parents and our station and our situation, even our race. Listen to this, folks. Listen to this crap. Beginning again. One of the individuals that I have been told about in this esoteric information was George Washington Carver, who deliberately incarnated into a race that was downtrodden to work on the idea of bringing them up. He was an ego of tremendous advancement, and when he did incarnate into that environment, which was a terrible environment, I understand he may have lost a few points, because he became embittered near the end. Had he remained without bitterness, he would have gained. This is the story I have. We all take a chance incarnating into a civilization that can drag us down, because when you get inside of a physical body, you become subject to the nuisances of that animal body, and the conditioning and the responses, and it's up to you with those ten qualities of mind, to overcome those. That's why being well-disciplined is vitally important, and permissiveness is not wise. Well, folks, there's no way I'm going to be able to read to you all of this interview, because it's just too long. So I'm going to pick out some pertinent uh, points. This is number two talking. 
uh, and this is an excerpt from a paragraph. However, don't permit it. Don't say laziness is good for everybody because you won't get uptight if you're lazy. We have so many errors on the idea of human potential and what to do with it. I believe in being well-disciplined, but not cruelly. I believe in responsibility in the organization I belong to. The Stell Group. The Stell Group. The group in which Lars Hansen was reared. Now, I want to quote to you from a book called The New World Order by A. Ralph Epperson, which you can order from Publius Press in Tucson, Arizona. On page 67 in The New World Order, Mr. A. Ralph Epperson has a direct quote from Eklal Kushana. He was the leader of the Stell Group. Mr. Tex Mars also has the same quote in one or two of his books. But I'm taking this from the New World Order by A. Ralph Epperson. Quote, Lucifer is the head of a secret brotherhood of spirits. The brotherhood is named after Lucifer because the great angel Lucifer has been responsible for the abolishment of Eden in order that men could begin on the road to a spiritual advancement. Unquote. That is the teachings of the leader of the Stell group, the group that this man belongs to. So, folks, pay attention. This again is number two speaking. This is a part of the message, a band of men at the dawning of the age of Taurus, a more civilized age embodied in the Great Pyramid's mathematical code to transmit to a generation of humans living in the age of Aquarius. Something they felt was vitally important. The age of Aquarius began 23 August 1953, and this is a new age idea. The idea that we can perceive and try to improve. Of course, there's still a larger majority of humans, even in the age of Aquarius, that want to drag people down and lower the standards. However, every single ego, every single human, has the capabilities of bringing himself up to the equal of his creator. It's just a matter of effort and patience and practicing the virtues. Number one, as Jesus stood between the two columns, Jachin and Boaz, in the outer porch of King Solomon's temple, John 10, verse 23, on 25th December, the celebration of the winter solstice, which is what that date is really for, a large majority of the people did not understand him when he said, Ye are gods. John 10, verse 34. Some people in the crowd took up stones to kill him as a money changer in the temple, cocked his head away from his table to see what some in the crowd were yelling about. He heard Jesus say, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods, as he saw a lawgiver of the temple sit bolt upright to listen to this man speaking to the crowd. The money changer wondered why such an important lawgiver of the temple sat up to listen, as rigid as a rod of iron, remembering the law and his responsibility. As the lawgiver remembered Psalm 82, verse 6, he remembered a psalm of Asaph, in which God said, Ye are gods. The man speaking to the crowd said, The Father is in me, and I in him. And what he meant could not have been other than what he said. As the crowd screamed blasphemy and moved forward to kill Jesus, he simply disappeared. So when you say humans have the capability to bring themselves up to the equal of their creator, it would seem to me that this new age idea is in reality a very, very ancient idea. However, you did say that this was part of the message of the Great Pyramid. But what about these ancient brotherhoods, these people who are responsible for all this secret type of teaching, which seems to be such a mystical notion? Are we still around today? Number two, I think so very much. In fact, I could say, I know it. You could say it's information now. The brothers are those individuals who have obtained a degree of advancement over other humans. This also is number two. If you meet a brother and you get him alone and you say, I've noticed about you certain things and I want to ask if you are familiar with the Rosicrucians or the Masons or the Stell Group or the book, The Ultimate Frontier, or some of these metaphysical philosophies, you, when you ask, are allowing him to interfere in your environment. This is the teacher appearing when the student is ready. But unless you ask, the brothers won't help. And here's the crux, folks. Number two. Yes, the fifth level of intelligence is responsible for the direct work with the planet. And they can make mistakes. The story of Lucifer and Jehovah is a tale of the mistake made by the angelic intelligence. 
The argument between the angelic forces on the fifth level of existence is that Jehovah, according to my philosophy, believed that humans could advance with a perfect environment. So at first humans were given the Edenic state. All they had to do was eat bananas, sleep, chase the girls, make love, swim, sun, and sleep. But they didn't grow in that Edenic state. They were lazy. All they wanted to do was eat, drink, make love, and sleep some more. They didn't want to grow. So Lucifer said, we should help mankind grow. And you know the rules. We can't go down and do it for them, so we'll give them problems to overcome. And Zach, like the thunderbolt of Zeus, Eden was gone, and we now have winters in Chicago, and man has to overcome. Now, folks, I don't care if this man worships Lucifer. I don't care if he believes what he believes or belongs to the mystery schools. You all know me. I believe in the Constitution and that we all have a right. But when he deceives and manipulates all of us, and when on June 8, 1993, on Radio Free America, he said to the world that I am a CIA disinformation agent and it's time that you knew who this man really is. I want you to track down and read these books that he wrote. The Great Pyramid, Man's Monument to Man, New York, Pinnacle Books, 1975. The Life and Death of Planet Earth, New York, Pinnacle Books, 1977. Psychic Surgery, 1973, reprint edition, Chicago, Pocket Books, 1975. The entire text of the interview you heard tonight can be found in a book called 5-5-2000, Ice the Ultimate Disaster, by Richard W. Noon, spelled N-O-O-N-E, and he was the interviewer number one. Folks, research the history of Willis Cardo. Research the history of the Liberty Lobby. And specifically, Radio Free America. Tom Valentine has been a member of the Stell Group for most of his life. He has also been closely connected to the Communist Party by his own admission. Wake up! The members, the high priests of the Mystery Schools, are enacting ordo ab chaos. Create enough chaos, and then they can step up and take control and establish order, the New World Order. Now you know why on Radio Free America Tom Valentine gets so angry when someone questions Freemasonry. Now you know why he covers for the secret societies and for Freemasonry. And now you know why he's attacked me because I am the enemy of Mystery Babylon. And there you have it, folks. And yes, there you do have it, ladies and gentlemen. I want to read to you a letter that I received today, talk about synchronicity, from my good friend in Tucson, Arizona, a. Ralph Epperson. He says, and I quote, You might enjoy letting your listeners know about a quote I just found in a book entitled Legenda of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States, written by Albert Pike. This book was written by Mr. Pike in 1888, three years before he died, and was published by the 33rd Degree Council when they were in Charleston, South Carolina. This quote should settle the question once and for all as to who the god is that the Masons worship in their lodges. Here in Tucson, one of their lodges is called a cathedral, and another is called a temple, two words describing places of worship. This quote will prove concretely that the god they worship is not the god of the Bible. I had been looking for this book by Pike for many years, and presumed that it was out of print because I couldn't locate a copy. However, I knew it was not forgotten, because Rex Hutchins, then a 32nd degree Mason, but who later became a 33rd degree Mason, quoted from it in his Masonic book entitled A Bridge to Light. So I considered it fortunate when I found that a publisher of out-of-print and rare books called Kessinger Publishing Company in Keela, Montana, had reprinted it. It is their claim that Legenda is a series of monographs intended to supplement the ritualistic instruction of the book written by Mr. Pike called Morals and Dogma. As you know, the first ten words of the Bible are found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and are, quote, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, unquote. That means that in the time before there was something, there had to be nothing. So God created something out of nothing when he created the universe, or there would not have been a need for a beginning. But Mr. Pike does not agree. This is what he says on page 109 of Legenda in his explanation of the 28th degree. Quote, nothing is produced from nothing, because existence can no more cease to be than nothing can cease not to be. 
To say that the world came forth from nothing is to propose a monstrous absurdity. Everything that is proceeds from that which was, and consequently nothing of that which is can ever not be. The letter I in the word is was capitalized by Mr. Pike. It is customary to capitalize the first letter in the name of a deity or a noun that refers to a deity. Does this mean that he is making a deity out of matter? Well, folks, Lucifer is the god of the material world. So Mr. Pike says that those of us who believe in a god who created the universe out of nothing believe in a monstrous absurdity. The Christians and the Jews who believe in the God of the Old and New Testaments believe in a monstrous absurdity when they profess that their God created the universe out of nothing. Let there be no doubt, Pike told his readers that he and the Masons do not worship the Creator God. They worship a secret and concealed God in their cathedrals and temples who cannot create anything. In fact, Mr. Pike agreed with that statement. He wrote this about their, quote, sun god, unquote, on pages 253 and 254 of Morals and Dogma. I might remind you that Radio Free America is carried by the Sun Radio Network. Quote, Amun, at first the god of lower Egypt, was the sun god. He created nothing, unquote. And to show that this is true, he repeated the idea on page 281. Quote, the supreme being of the Egyptians was Amun, a secret and concealed god, the original light. He creates nothing, unquote. Yet he calls this god the supreme being. If the universe had two gods, one who created everything from nothing, and one who created nothing, I would presume the first god who made everything, including the second god, would be superior to the second god who created nothing. So the only way you can resolve this problem, if you believe in this second God who created nothing, is to claim that there is no creator God. Then your God can then become the supreme being. And that is what Mr. Pike did. Make no mistake about it. The Masons do not worship the creator God, the God who made the world out of nothing. And that is why they have chosen to call their God the great architect of the universe. And that is why the Brotherhood in the ancient times was called the Builders and today are called Free Masons, or Free Masons in the French. It is known that architects do not draw plans to create a structure out of nothing. They design structures that must be built from existing materials or, if you will, out of materials that must be changed from one form to another before they can be integrated into a structure. The Masons worship some other being, one that they know can create nothing, and that includes the Stell group. That includes the ancient order of the Rosencross, the Knights Templars, the sovereign and military order of the Knights of Malta, and all of the rest of these skunks. The number one Mason of all time has said it, ladies and gentlemen, in his own writings. I have never claimed that Tom Valentine was a Freemason. I have only claimed what you have heard in this broadcast tonight, and I am sick of his stinking lies, and I am sick and tired of you stupid sheeple out there who cannot study or listen or repeat exactly what you hear, but have to make up some strange tale in order to cover your pathetic ignorance. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not attack people. I reveal them. I wish nobody ill will. I don't care what altar anyone worships upon. You are listening to a true constitutionalist who believes 100% in our right to protect us, the religion of our choice. I would fight for any one of you if that right were threatened to be taken away. Where I draw the line is when you lie, when you deceive, and when you manipulate the rest of us to pit us against each other so that you can bring about your silly, stupid utopia, your dream of a thousand years of peace on this earth, you will never do it because you are mankind just like me and everyone else who you claim are nothing but cattle. And because you are man just like me and everyone else, you suffer for the same inherent failings that I and everybody else who lives upon this earth suffers from. You have the same temptations and the same greed and you fight every day against these things. And to say that you, you are the only truly mature minds in this world 
and that you are going to control the rest of us because we do not have the capability or the power to think for ourselves is not only ludicrous, but is what eventually will bring you to your knees as we round you up and throw you in the jails and the prisons where you belong and stop your wrecking of all the good that man has built upon the face of this earth. Don't pervert my words, because I'm the only one you'll ever hear on the radio who uses fact, who uses the own words of the people that I talk about, and I have no ulterior motive of trying to hurt anyone. The only reason for this broadcast, and for me sitting here, ladies and gentlemen, is to wake the sheeple, empower the people, and try, like hell, to save freedom for not only this country, but for the entire world. Now, if you cannot understand what you heard tonight, then you are one of the most stupid ones out there. Those of you who are sheeple, who think you understood but aren't quite sure, but you believe that you are getting some meaning from what you heard tonight, you have a chance. And of course, the rest of you, the people who have listened to the over 32 hours of the mystery series that we've aired on this program, you already know the truth. And you are the hope for the future in this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I've said it before and I'll say it again. These people practice the Hegelian conflict, political resolution. And they control both sides of each conflict. Tom Valentine never said a word on his program about Freemasonry until I forced him to by my broadcasts. And if you don't believe that, you go back and listen to all the tapes. Remember, a nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Shortly after I originally ran this program, Tom Valentine came on with the master of the Stell Group and claimed that he became a Christian in 1968 and left the Stell Group forever. And that is a lie. Because in the interview that you just heard, he claimed that he was loyal to the group to which he belonged, the Stell Group. That interview was conducted in 1976, and that book was published in 1982. I've said it before, I will say it again. Tom Valentine, you are a liar, and if you are not, sue me. We'll let a court of law determine it. I have all the evidence I need, mister. All of you out there listening, good night. And whether you believe it or not, I mean this from my heart. God bless you all. Across the Americas and around the world, once again you're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper, and in studio... It's Carolyn Nelson. Folks, I'm going to be on a little investigative trip here for the next week, and while I'm going, you're going to hear reruns on both time slots. Those of you listening now have probably never heard these episodes of the Hour of the Time, and you should always listen to this broadcast with a pad of paper and a pencil or pen by your side. Never, ever make the mistake of sitting down without a pad of paper and a pen or pencil to listen to the hour of the time. We have very short patience around here for people who do not follow directions. So if you call up and want us to, to recount the show for you because you didn't have your pad of paper and your pencil, I'm sorry, we don't have time to do that. We're very, very busy here. So make sure you get it. The first time, if you miss a telephone number, because we only say it once, that's okay. Um, now, I want you all to remember and try to catch both broadcasts each day, simply because they're not the same, ever. What's broadcast in this time slot, 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 Mountain, 7 Central, and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is not the same information that is broadcast during the later time slot, which is 9 Pacific, 10 Mountain, 11 Central, and Midnight Eastern Standard Time. Tonight's show is important, for it verifies everything that I've been telling you in the Mystery Babylon series. 
which we have done 31 episodes of, and we have included The Dawn of Man, which ran prior to the production of the Mystery Babylon series, in any orders for this series. So, that actually makes 32 tapes. But tonight's episode will be episode number 32 of the series known as Mystery Babylon. Don't go away, folks. You need to know what you're going to hear tonight. For those of you who don't believe that those who call themselves illumined, the only truly mature minds in this world, and thus are the only ones capable of deciding the future or of ruling the rest of us, those of you who don't believe these people have infiltrated all levels of our society, our government, our military, our law enforcement, I want you to listen carefully to what I'm going to read you. I'm going to quote verbatim an article which appeared in the newsletter called Aid and Abet Police Newsletter, Volume 2, Constitutional Issues for Lawmen, Number 1, Volume 2, Number 1. That's Aid and Abet Police Newsletter. Now, this letter, according to the editor of this newsletter, was written by a police chief. Here he uses a pseudonym, so he says, so that the police chief's identity is not revealed. However, as you will find out, if you have listened to our series on Mystery Babylon, this is not just a police chief. This is a highly degreed member of the Masonic Lodge. And he gives himself away with his symbology. For at the end of his article, he signs it, quote, so mote it be, unquote. Aid and Abet is put out by Officer Jack McLam, who has been written up as one of the best police officers ever produced by the state of Arizona. We neither endorse him, nor do we condemn him. As far as Kaji is concerned, our vote is not in yet on this organization. We know that in order to bring about the New World Order, they need to identify everyone who will uphold the real law, the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. They need to identify those people and get them out of positions of authority, and if necessary, take them out of society completely. There are organizations which exist solely for the purpose of identifying those people in government, those people in the Patriot community, those police officers serving in police organizations who would ultimately support the Constitution and the Bill of Rights against any effort to destroy it. Aid and abet may be one of these means. We do not know that for certain. But if you listen to this letter... This letter, because it's signed with a pseudonym, may not be from a police chief at all, but may be from those who control aid and abet to tell the police officers what is expected of them in the New World Order. Again, we do not know this to be true, but we have discovered, ladies and gentlemen, in our investigations that those who oppose us who would destroy us, use the Hegelian dialectic of political conflict resolution. They control both sides of every issue. They set in motion methods and means to identify their enemy and destroy their enemy before their enemy can hurt them. And that's why we have been on the losing end for literally thousands of years with these people. I now quote from this newsletter. To the question of, do some judges, prosecutors, and police officers today commit dishonest acts to put criminals away? I answer an unequivocal yes. But it is hoped that it is not done without just cause. True immorality exists only when the cause is not just. Notice how they've turned the definition of morality around. 
And he goes on, After more than 20 years of service to my fellow Americans, I realize what reality is. The truth is that today many judges, attorneys, police officials, and officers are devotees of the religion of secular humanism, myself included. Some of our members, mainly out of fear, will not admit that SH is a religion, that secular humanism is a religion. They are apprehensive that we might be treated as the so-called Christians have been treated under the doctrine of separation of church and state. Such fear might be well-founded if this were 15 to 20 years ago. Not so today. Reason being, colleagues of our faith are, for the most part, in control of the agencies and organizations such as the ACLU, ABA, Justice Department, etc., that would normally protest such cases. Although this may at first seem unfair, it is not. But allow me to proceed, and I believe you will come to full understanding of this and many other important facts. My feelings are that it is time we shepherds open the eyes of our flock and further sort out those we cannot take with us into the 21st century. I'm going to pause here. In case you don't understand exactly what this man just said, I'm going to read this paragraph again to you. Remember, this is purported to be a police chief writing under a pseudonym to the police newsletter called Aid and Abet. Listen very carefully, ladies and gentlemen, and you'll see when I've labeled you sheeple, I have not been... I have not been incorrect. Quote, My feelings are that it is time we shepherds open the eyes of our flock and further sort out those we cannot take with us into the 21st century. Now, those of you who thought that I was insane when I told you that if you don't go along with the New World Order, if you can't renounce your old religion and your old societal ways and your old morals and conform to the new age, you will be exterminated. They make no secret of this. I continue. Any that would deny that our religion of secular humanism is not a valid religion should do their homework. The Supreme Court decided that it is a religion some years ago in the Torcaso v. Abington, Abington v. Shemp, and in Torcaso v. Watkins cases. According to the High Court, it is, quote, belief, not body, creed, or cult, which appears to be the essence of religion, unquote. It further explains that, quote, belief refers to some sort of universal view of life of the world of mankind, a belief that is held to be true about mankind, unquote. In essence, the Supreme Court said that one's religion can be, quote, any world view with or without reference to God, theistic or non-theistic in nature, unquote. I hope this helps others to understand our faith. However, this, of course, is not the main point of my speech. I wish to address the abuse of police officers who ascribe, knowingly or unknowingly, to the moral tenets of our religion in regards to ethics and morals. Nationwide, our devotees are enduring horrible discrimination at the hands of a very hypocritical faction of society, the Christians. This discrimination comes as we humanists exercise our own religious beliefs and apply our morals quote, on the job, unquote, so to speak. Yet other officers may apply their own individual belief systems, morals, and ethics at will without any condemnation. This is undeniable discrimination. Fortunately, our religion is the fastest growing of any in all of history, and many of the younger generation within the criminal justice system, including police officers who ascribe to sound secular humanist principles, are now in management, which is of benefit to all. This does give us sway power and is a plus for our side. Still, there is far too much discrimination against those who would apply a most important principle of our religion. Quote, situation ethics, unquote. The principle of situation ethics allows the individual to focus correctly on only the goal to be accomplished. Morally speaking, little if any consideration need be given to the method or means as nothing else supersedes its importance. Of course, concern is given to finding a means of accomplishing a task or goal so as to have the least negative impact on the least amount of our people. Notice he says our people. 
In my youth, I recall hearing the great Green Bay Packer coach Vince Lombardi describe it this way, quote, Winning is not everything, it is the only thing, unquote. Much of our society lives by this principle today. Yes, even many of those who profess other faiths and occupy pulpits throughout America. Personally, I think the principle of situation ethics is best described by examining the legal definition of ethics and morals given by our now compatriots, the communists. The communist definition is, quote, everything is ethical and moral as long as it promotes world communism, unquote. This is pure secular humanism. We can learn much, incidentally, about total commitment from the communists. The Marxists have, out of pragmatic necessity, expurgated a minimum of 90 million people in the pursuit of man's noblest mission, world peace. What intelligent person could call immoral any means used to accomplish this all-important goal? Do you, do you think this guy's playing with a full load of bricks here? I don't. And he continues, in our great humanist manifestos, signed in 1933 and 1973, we explain our moral creed, which is very much the same as the Marxist creed, yet set forth in much more palatable and tactful terms. Here is a brief summation of our beliefs regarding ethics and truth. Ethics. Moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics is autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. Ethics stems from human need and interest. To deny this distorts the whole basis of life. We strive for the good life here and now. And that's from the Humanist Manifesto 2, written and signed in 1973. Authority and Truth we reject those features of traditional religious morality that denies humans a full appreciation of their own potentialities and responsibilities. Traditional religions often offer solace to humans, but as often they inhibit humans from helping themselves or experiencing their full potentialities. We can discover no divine purpose or providence for the human species. Humans are responsible for what we are or will become. Remember, folks, I educated you in that part of the Masonic religion and the religion of the Rosen Cross and the Knights Templar and the Knights of Malta, the Red Cross of Constantine. All of these believe that man is in a state of becoming. Becoming what? Becoming gods. I continue. Humans are responsible for what we are or will become. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. That's from the Humanist Manifesto 2, 1973. After 20 plus years of conditioning, our society now largely subscribes to this philosophy. Some of you who practice selective Christianity are closer to our faith than to the superstitions of the Bible thumpers of old. In selective Christianity, of course, you choose certain portions of the so-called Word of God to believe in and discard the parts that are not convenient. Don't you see that in this we are just alike? Your faith is actually based upon what is right under man's desire. We humanists are, in fact, more honest. We admit that there is no God that it is only man's desires that are important. You leaders of these selective Christians preach that your faith is based on some parts of God's law, but in actuality the majority is based on what feels good or is convenient. Now I must break here for just a second, folks, to tell anyone who may have just tuned in that these are not my words. If you're sitting there with your lower jaw on your chest, looking aghast at your radio, you are not listening to the thoughts of William Cooper or the hour of the time. I am quoting verbatim from a letter attributed to a police chief. And this letter can be found in Aid and Abet, a police newsletter, volume 2, number 1, in case you want to pursue this.
Quite obviously, I'm continuing now, quite obviously, America's government now operates under the guiding principles of humanism. Deception, lying, cheating, stealing, killing is all moral if it promotes the attainment of our essential goals. This is true righteousness. Folks, I've got to stop right here and tell you this is true bullshit. This is deception at its worst. For these people are actually believing that wrong is right and right is wrong. And that is exactly what we were warned about in these days. And that is what I warned you about in my book, Behold a Pale Horse. And I told you years ago that the belief of these people is that the ends justify the means, whatever they might be. If they must kill two billion people to make their dream come true, they will do it. Mark my words, they will do it. A prime example, I continue now, a prime example can be seen in the recent war against Iraq. Over 250,000 have lost their lives so far, and more are dying every day, all for the attainment of a higher good. The goal of our great humanist leaders, world peace through world government. You see, the writer of this letter understood what I understood about the Gulf War. It wasn't about Iraq taking Kuwait. It was, in fact, about a new world order. George Bush even stated that. He said in our speech, his speech, I should say, our fifth goal in the Middle East is a new world order. Though I would venture to say that he stated it as his fifth goal in order not to give it too much attention in the public eye. It was actually the first goal, ladies and gentlemen. I continue. This New Age teaching is the reason why, for example, a police officer, one of secular humanist persuasion, is likely to risk his very life to save a member of society one moment, and the very next moment, take the witness stand and lie in order to win an important case. This is not to be considered immoral, given the particular standard of ethics upon which such an officer bases his morality, namely, that the end justifies any means. In other words, again, the higher good principle. Many people still do not understand this. They don't understand that this is why our presidents and their staffs, members of Congress and hosts of others with leadership roles in America, lawyers, judges, etc., lie and cheat right alongside our dedicated humanist law enforcers to repeat all for the greater good of society or, in effect, the system. And I add, outside the letter written by the chief, if it is really a chief, ladies and gentlemen, that all of these people belong to the secret societies. The ones who lie and cheat and murder. And I continue. What the masses must be made to understand and never be allowed to forget is that this is for their own good. They should know by now that those who are actually in control of our government, as Colonel Oliver North explained, truly know what is best for the people. They must also know that under the New World Order, the justice system's primary mission will be to protect the system from the masses. It is precisely in view of this that we on the inside have been obligated all along to use the system to suppress dissenters as quickly as possible before any radical anti-world government, anti-humanist group can gain the upper hand. I must read that again, folks, for those of you who may be a little bit slow in understanding, and some of us are especially with something that you can't quite grasp and never heard before. That's excusable. Again, what the masses must be made to understand and never be allowed to forget is that this is for their own good. They should know by now that those who are actually in control of our government, as Colonel Oliver North explained, truly know what is best for the people. They must also know that under the New World Order, the justice system's primary mission will be to protect the system from the masses. It is precisely in view of this that we on the inside have been obligated all along to use the system 
to suppress dissenters as quickly as possible before any radical anti-world government, anti-humanist group can gain the upper hand. You're aware, of course, that the vast majority of Americans seek only peace and security. They hardly even realize that they have virtually made government their new god, to which they turn for the fulfillment of every need. Our New Age leaders, and we soldiers as their arms and legs, stand ready to give the masses all for which they pray. And ladies and gentlemen, I, William Cooper, in the hour of the time, have warned you that if you don't wake up, if you don't change the course of the future, that you would get exactly what you want, and that you would be slaves in a new world order. You see, to revert to the state of childhood means you must have a daddy. Some daddies aren't too nice, and even the nice ones restrict your personal freedoms until you reach the age of maturity. In this case, there will be no age of maturity. I can assure you. I continue with the letter. Let me repeat. Our job within the criminal justice system today is to protect the plan, the system, and punish those that our leaders decide are enemies of that system. You doubted me when I said there was a plan, ladies and gentlemen? There is the verification that there is, in fact, a plan, an ancient plan. I continue. Of course now, as with our Soviet colleagues, under New Age humanist situation ethics, we are not limited in the methods we may apply to win. We can therefore proceed with unobstructed haste to make the masses safe and peaceful. <laughs> Let's look again at our example of that police officer who routinely risks his life for others and yet will lie on the witness stand to help his government win some case in court. If some of you are still surprised at this, then perhaps you haven't understood what I have been trying to convey, nor have you understood what your children have learned so well over the last 20 years within the government school system. It is that we are living in a new age where man has wisely placed his trust in government instead of some superstition called the divine or God. It is the old religious morals that have caused all of our problems. A new age calls for a new belief system, a new moral code, a new religion. It is exciting to see most all of the religions of the world coming nicely together, united in preparation to serve the new world order. Remember, I told you that your religious leaders are not really on your side, and all the churches that belong to the World Council of Churches are bringing you all closer to one religion which will not resemble anything that Christ taught. I continue. We must all dedicate ourselves to obeying our leaders without question and to the instruction of succeeding generations toward our utopian goals of world peace. I would like to introduce you to one present-day scholar, Dr. Sidney Simon, who has been very effective and deserving of much credit, deserving of much credit for his efforts in this work of re-educating humanity. He speaks plainly and his meaning is unmistakable as when he says, quote, We do not need any more preaching about right and wrong. The old thou shalt not simply are not relevant. Unquote. He goes on to explain to the child educators he is addressing that, quote, Values clarification, unquote, is a method for teachers to change the values of children without getting caught. Values clarification is just another term for situation ethics. A book in use by educators called Weep for Our Children spells out values clarification as part of the new morality. Listen to this carefully. This is a book in use by teachers teaching your children right this moment. It's called Weep for Our Children. Quote, 
It's okay to lie. It's okay to steal. It's okay to have premarital sex. It's okay to cheat or to kill if these things are part of your value system and you have clarified these values for yourself. The important thing is not what values you choose, but that you have chosen them yourself freely and without coercion of parents, spouse, priest, friends, ministers, or social pressure of any kind, unquote. And that makes me very, very angry. That's one of the reasons my daughter is not in school and never will be in school. She already now knows more now than most children twice her age from the homeschooling that she gets. This is incredible. Don't go away. I have to take a breath. It makes me angry just to read this crap. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read the last paragraph again. I want you to hear this. Remember, this is a book in use by teachers, educators, called Weep for Our Children, and it spells out values clarification as part of the new morality. Quote, it's okay to lie. It's okay to steal. It's okay to have premarital sex. It's okay to cheat or to kill if these things are part of your value system and you have clarified these values for yourself. The most important thing is not what values you choose, but that you have chosen them yourself freely and without coercion of parents, spouse, priest, friends, ministers, or social pressure of any kind, unquote. It is such that secular humanism proponents in the government schools, the teachers whom we can thank for remolding the values of these next generations. When the government national child care bill is passed, it will be a great day for humanists and proponents of world peace. What wonders we can achieve once we have the attention of the nation's preschoolers for six to nine hours a day. Look what we have already accomplished with the older age groups of America's youth. As I hinted earlier, this new society based on the deity of man will demand a new kind of law enforcer. Remember I told you? They believe that man is in a state of becoming, becoming what? A god. He says, as I hinted earlier, this new society based on the deity of man will demand a new kind of law enforcer. One of our educators said to me some weeks ago, America's religious zealots of the past would be shocked at the changes the people have allowed. She was correct, for after all, it was James Madison that said, quote, We have staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God, unquote. Ah, but it is a new day, and we are fast proceeding into the 21st century. Americans no longer wish to assume the responsibilities of governing themselves. Happily for them, there is a whole new generation of very dedicated leaders and enforcers in government to see that they are cared for. Let me address for a moment the question of police manpower. As the citizens relinquish, out of fear, more of their rights, more enforcers are required to regulate and supervise the people's activities so that they remain safe and peaceful. Who would have thought 100 years ago that the integration of fear of literally everything would have been the answer to establishing the New World Order? Credit for this innovation goes to the free thinkers of the last generation. And folks, if you think he's wrong, just look at yourselves. Look what you've put up with. Look what you've allowed to happen. Look at the state our nation is in. Look at the fact that we've already lost most of the Bill of Rights, the portion of the Constitution known as the First Ten Amendments. You all file and pay income taxes, which you are not required to file or pay. You do everything out of fear. And that's why you're known as the sheeple, most of you. 
not all, but most, without any doubt. Most of you, that title fits like a handmade pair of Italian shoes. It's very comfortable, isn't it? Isn't it? Now the older generation, known as peace officers, servants of the people, might not so readily have adopted nor fit into this new order of things. Fortunately, this has not posed too great a problem due to the fact that they are rapidly being replaced through natural attrition, in effect death or retirement, and now Hillary's running around the country, folks, wants to open a dialogue on euthanasia. Timely, isn't it? I continue. The next seven to eight years will see the last of them removed. At the same time, police agencies are of necessity attempting more and more to screen out before hiring those prospective officers who believe in the old religious superstitions. This is wise because these zealots will not do the things that will be required of them under the new system. Those remaining police officers who openly profess a belief system steeped on old-world religious fundamentalism can be and are being phased out on any number of charges such as can be substantiated over time or with the help of a little innovation on the part of new management. And we believe that this organization aid in a vet may be the organ used to identify those police officers. I continue. Before I continue, I better clarify, folks. We believe that, and we have good grounds for our belief. However, we cannot prove it. You must make up your own mind, yourselves. I continue. Some of these old-time officers complain that this type of job discrimination is unconstitutional and immoral. But we know they are wrong. Under situation ethics, all things are moral as long as they promote the goal. Therefore, they are not being removed for any evil cause. They are incompatible and simply non-functional for the duties that will be required of them. You might ask yourself, ladies and gentlemen, what are the duties that will be required of them? I think you've already seen some examples at Ruby Ridge and Waco, Texas and many other places. And I go on with the letter. I feel I need to say again that if a professional police officer must lie against those who violate the law, then it is moral. The same is true when government judges and attorneys withhold evidence and witnesses from the jury to win their cases. When a politician lies to win an office or makes deals that promote the new order, it is moral. Let me tell you what is truly immoral. I will use the issuance of traffic citations as only one example. True immorality is when five out of ten good upstanding citizens take the witness stand, swear an oath to their God, and then proceed to fabricate lies to get out of their tickets. This our enforcement officers witness daily in court. To them, this is not only immoral, but highly hypocritical. The enforcer's dishonesty helps society as a whole. If a government agent lied for personal reasons, then it would be immoral. If done for the betterment of mankind... It is not, and that is the most important lesson I bring you today. It is one thing when a leader or agent of government has to lie or otherwise deceive his subjects. It is quite another when an ordinary individual from among the masses, quote, bites the hand that feeds him, unquote, by lying to those who are bringing salvation in this brave new world. Do we see this important difference? The old world understood that it was the greatest of sins to lie or to deceive God. The generations of devotees that wish to enter the new world must likewise be brought 
to the understanding that it is the greatest of sins to lie to deceive their new god government. Any such disloyalty would surely hamper the progress of those engaged in ushering in the glorious new world order. We are not concerned with the few who may resist this new order, for out of pragmatic necessity their fate has been amply allowed for in the master plan. What we are most concerned about at present is that the obedient masses be made to understand that it is detrimental to progress for them to suggest that their supervisors wallow under the pressure and futility of the antiquated superstitions, morals, and dogma of the past. There will be some difficult changes facing the person entering this new society. On these issues, however, we can assure the people there will be no compromise. Thank you for listening. May the blessing of the new order come swiftly upon us. So mote it be. So mote it be is taken directly from the initiation ceremonies of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. And you will hear it nowhere else, ladies and gentlemen. Whoever wrote this was a highly degreed Freemason of the Scottish Rite. And he is under a pseudonym explaining the true purpose, the true religion, and the true plan for the religion that those who frequent the Lodge actually adhere to. So you see, in Aid and Abet, the Police Newsletter, Volume 2, Number 1, all of the police officers who subscribe to this newsletter are the good guys. The good guys. They have been delivered a warning from a police chief under a pseudonym which makes it very plain what will happen to any police officer who does not go along with the new world order. And I say that it was intentionally that way. And that there is no police chief, Rupert Orpheus, pseudonym or not, but this is the policy that needed to be explained to all of these officers at once to hasten their decision. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes right down to it, most people will do what they're told, when they're told, if they're told, and they have been told. I hope that you are intelligent enough to understand what you have just heard and exactly what it means. If you are not, if you are not, dear sheeple, God have mercy upon your soul. You are going to need it. Those long-time listeners to the hour of the time, those who have been awake for quite some time, those who were never asleep understand that there is a plan in the world that the members of the secret societies, by whatever name they call themselves to you, the profane, in their exoteric language, are using to bring about the ages-old dream of a new world order where the masses are totally and completely controlled for each and every second of every moment, of every hour, of every day of their lives. And where the priests of the mysteries govern in what they call a council of wise men. The public at large will not know much about this council of wise men, for there will be at the head of this council a charismatic religious and political leader. This is necessary for the public needs somewhere to vent their emotions, their elations, their angers. 
and it will make no difference if they topple this leader from his throne. The real leaders will remain untouched as they have remained untouched throughout the history of the world. Those of you who really believe that this hick, William Clinton, is leading this nation and making the decisions, you probably, at some point within the last 24 hours, thought you were Rush Limbaugh and sat on half your brain. And those of you who believe that you really have a choice at election time, when the choice has already been made, and it's especially damaging if you believe that your vote really counts when it is the Electoral College that elects the president. And in fact, that's really not necessary unless some ringer slips into the choice. Like Gary Hart. Didn't you wonder why Gary Hart was completely and totally destroyed forever because someone photographed him on a boat with one woman not doing anything wrong? And Bill Clinton is not even tarnished. Don't you understand... Bill Clinton is just a messenger boy. And if he gets impeached, it will not solve anything. And those of you running around signing petitions to impeach William Clinton had better read the Constitution of the United States of America. You see, you cannot impeach, impeach a president because somebody signed a petition. I don't care if 200 million Americans sign that petition. You cannot impeach William Clinton, you fools. You must prove that he has committed high crimes and misdemeanors. And you must have solid evidence. And you must have witnesses that don't die overnight. And documentation that doesn't disappear by the time next week comes along. Do you understand? Once again, they have you whirling around in circles at the end of a cul-de-sac. Good night. And God bless you all.